All right, so we're live. Uh, so welcome, guys, to my um, hopefully going to be my new series called um, uh, Interview Series uh, with Bitcoiners. And uh, my first guest is Jan Pritzker, and he wrote the book Inventing Bitcoin. And uh, today we're going to talk about the, the, the problems that we had to resolve uh, before we have something like Bitcoin. And, and also, we're going to try to explain in the very simple terms what is Bitcoin, uh, right? So it's easy and uh, um, it's easy to understand what it is. Because I think even if, if you look at it from the technical side of view, there all, there's always a way to look at it uh, that can kind of open your mind and you can understand the scope of it. So, okay, be, be, you know, without further ado, um, Jan Pritzker. So the, the first curious question, because I know your story is very interesting. Uh, I came from the same background. I, I'm very curious uh, to know and understand how do you come about um, writing this book? Uh, you know, where did you, uh, I mean, where did you grow up? What made you uh, decide to write the book? And um, just tell us your life story. Sure, sure. So first of all, thank you, Kastutis, for having me on. It's a great pleasure. Um, so yeah, my story is, you know, I grew up in the former Soviet Union actually, which, uh, I guess we share that, uh, history, uh, I came from Ukraine. My parents, um, were lucky enough to leave that horrible place, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so basically, uh, the Soviet Union, for those of you who don't know, um, was a, a very strictly, uh, controlled economy. Okay. The, the government would plan everything. The prices of everything were set and we're going to get into all, um, some of that a little bit later. Um, but people also couldn't leave. There was a very big uh, period where there was just no immigration allowed. Uh, so around 1989 uh, was a window when immigration opened up, and my parents um, luckily got me out of there. Uh, I was about seven years old, I think, when we, when we left. Uh, so we came to the U.S., and my dad was actually a computer programmer. Uh, well, he was a civil engineer with some computer background. And uh, when we got to the States, he didn't really speak English that well, so he became a programmer. Great uh, job for somebody who doesn't speak the language. Um, and so that I got really into computers from a young age. So actually one of the first things that we bought, I mean, we were like poor, you know, we were living on nothing. And one of the first things that my dad saved up money for was a computer, got me my first Commodore 64. I started playing with code when I was a kid, started playing games, you know, um, by the time I got to like junior high and high school, I was doing some pretty significant coding. I was actually making some money doing, you know, like consulting and helping people build very early websites, web applications, things like that. Uh, and then I went to school. I decided to, you know, focus on computer science and linguistics. And I thought I was going to work on AI and machine learning and stuff like that. Um, but eventually, I got just really um, interested in startups because I had uh, a few internships in the summer uh, at a startup, and I just got so into the idea of working at a tech startup where people are just passionate about what they're building. And basically, spent my next, you know, ten years jumping from different startup to different startup. I was a co-founder at a couple of places. I was an early engineer, um, but my entire career sort of built around being an early stage startup person. And uh, in 2012, I launched or helped start Reverb.com. Uh, Reverb was like my first really, really big successful startup. I had a few small successes, uh, but Reverb was kind of a really big deal. Um, when we started in 2012, it was just me and, and David, uh, the, the other founder who was uh, more on the business side. And I basically did all the technology stuff, right? I, I wrote all the code, I hired all the devs, I managed some of the early developers, I built up some teams, um, and then uh, basically served the CTO for about five years uh, and also ran the infrastructure team eventually. Uh, and so we built that business you know, from just the two of us to when I was leaving in 2018, it was like 150 people. We were doing about $500 million in sales annually uh, and basically became the number one destination for musicians to buy and sell gear and to learn about new stuff coming to market and uh, learn about their favorite artists. So we really just built this awesome destination. So that's my story. Um, I was into technology. I'm still into technology. Now, how does this apply to Bitcoin? Well, I actually heard about Bitcoin in 2011 uh, from Slashdot, uh, which is like this new site for nerds. I think it's still around. Nobody reads it anymore, which is sad. Um, but at the time, it was great. And I heard about Bitcoin. I had no idea what it was. Um, like many people who first heard about Bitcoin, I, I thought it was some kind of experimental um, payment technology. I bought some Bitcoin. I think I'm on Gox. I think it was like $30, which was 
pretty much the peak of that bubble. I bought the top of that bubble and I watched my Bitcoin go from 30 to two. And when it was at $2, I was like, okay, this is just a joke. I, I still didn't know what it was. I literally didn't even read the first thing about it. So I forgot about it, right? I lost those keys, that Bitcoin's gone. Um, I either lost it or I sold it at $2, I don't remember. I remember the number $2, but after that I basically forgot about it. That laptop's gone. Um, next time, so and then I, you know, I kept working on startups. Next time I heard about Bitcoin was 2013. Uh, again, another uh, bubble, another cycle. Uh, this time it was at a thousand dollars, and you know, um, I saw that there was an app called Coinbase, and it was like really shiny, much nicer than Mount Gox. So I was like, okay, maybe this is legitimate. Um, so I bought some Bitcoin again at a thousand dollars. Again, I bought the top. Again, I watched it go down to like three hundred, and again, I forgot about it <laughs> because I figured, you know, um, whatever this is, you know, I'll just let it ride out. At this point, I didn't, I didn't sell it. I just kept it at Coinbase, and, and I, I basically forgot about it. I kept working on my stuff. Um, and for the next couple of years, I just you know kept working on, on Reverb, and the business was doing really well. I had no time for you know silly internet money. Um, but in 2016, I finally like had a wake up call because first of all, the price uh, the price was moving. I saw it going to like six hundred dollars, seven hundred dollars. I said, okay, something's happening here. And I started like watching videos. I started watching uh, Andreas Antonopoulos videos, which were awesome. Um, by the way, if you guys are new to Bitcoin. Highly recommend going out and watching uh, Currency Wars by Andreas and also The Monuments of uh, Immutability. Both really excellent talks. I think um, Andreas is a big inspiration to me because he has a good way of like bringing the concepts of Bitcoin to to like everyday metaphors. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Can I just say something? Um, I think um, Andreas, I, I equate Andreas to, um, uh, to the current day Milton Friedman. Uh, <laughs> yeah, in, yeah, in some ways, definitely. Definitely, like he puts things into language that people can understand, and I think that's that's where my inspiration was, right? So once I got down that rabbit hole, I basically just spent like a year listening to podcasts, listening to videos, watching every Andreas video I could get my hands on. We, I finally read the white paper. I think it was towards the end of 2016, which is embarrassing, right? Five years from the time I heard about Bitcoin to actually reading what it was. Um, so I would recommend not making that mistake. If you're hearing about Bitcoin today, uh, go and read the white paper. It's not that technical. It's not that long. Um, well, hopefully, hopefully, I mean, not many people are going to go and read the white paper. I mean, few, few will. My book, but, my book but, first, then read the white paper. <laughs> but, but the the point of this um, interview is hopefully, and I really think that um, we're going to try to unravel and uh, look at it uh, in interesting ways. And hopefully just watching this video will be enough for people to understand Bitcoin, you know, and not necessarily understand Bitcoin in, from the technical point of view, but really what the hell it is, you know? Right. So, yeah. Yeah. So basically, yeah. So I just got really into it. Um, I started, you know, I was fully converted. I, so the interesting thing is I actually, when I, when I got into Bitcoin, which was, you know, mid 2016, um, Ethereum was also like uh, on the scene. It was making a lot of noise, right? And because I was a developer, you know, I was like talking to my other developers in the office of Reverb and I was saying like, you guys heard of Bitcoin, you guys heard of Ethereum and everybody's like, yeah, 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 Ethereum, Ethereum. It's like this new decentralized app thing. So I went to their um, homepage and I saw like, you can build a bank in a hundred lines of code. And it was actually really, really impressive, right? Their marketing was really good. Mm. Uh, so I, I think I spent the first six months of my sort of Bitcoin time actually more on understanding Ethereum, how that worked. And, uh, because the value proposition for developers is very clear, but it took me a really long time until I actually came around and like, I, I guess you call it a cleansing, <laughs> listening to um, Bitcoin maximalists and like really, really understanding what Bitcoin is to really understand. Awakening. Like, yeah. Awakening. Awakening. This, this is the, the most important thing we could be working on, right? That this has like always been my, my thing, you know, as I've gotten more experience with my, technology expertise it's like what what should i use my powers for right i have i can create technology i can explain technology to people pretty well like what should i be spending my time on and and i really understood that bitcoin was that thing bitcoin is the thing that's going to make the most impact on humanity if it succeeds and it's our job to make it succeed it's not going to succeed by itself that's right. kind of what what you know people's our job is to evangelize it to explain it right, right. and that's kind of where where i came um to that conclusion and started spending more more and more of my time on Bitcoin. Okay, so what I notice is that um, the people who uh, uh, get Bitcoin, um, there's a, this, this light bulb comes on and then um, there's, it's almost like 
they've been programmed now to be a, a Bitcoin, you know, evangelist or whatever. It's it's almost like um, th there is no gray ground, gray area, right? Yeah. It's just like boom, the light bulb is on, and you and then your mission is just one thing. It's almost like somebody puts the mission in, and then you just go there. Like a red pill, yeah, for sure. Yeah. And it's it's a very yeah. strange thing because, like, when, when you understand it, you understand that literally this is this is the thing. This is the thing that solves the many many of the problems that we have in society and and all that. And like for me, what drew because it, yeah, uh, sorry, uh, because I think it speaks to your soul. It just consumes yeah. all of you. You know, right, once you sure. get it, it's, and it was it was very it struck home for me. So like, I grew up in the Soviet Union, right? In the Soviet Union, you had this government run economy. So basically, the government setting the prices on goods. Uh, like salary, like everything, right? And so what did we have? We had shortages everywhere. People stood in line for bread. Um, a pair of jeans would cost you a month's salary. It was like ridiculous, right? N nothing made sense. Um, but the thing is you can't have that system unless you have complete control of the currency, okay? You couldn't actually own US dollars. You, you could not own foreign currency in the, in the Soviet Union because that would completely undermine the, the system, right? Mm -hmm. um, the the Soviet government would just print money as as needed, and mm -hmm. that was part of the way that they would finance these different things. And then they would like cause massive inflation, and then they would try to control the inflation by fixing prices. Like nothing made sense, right? Right. Um, so the interesting thing is, I actually asked my parents once they got in more and more into Bitcoin. I started actually researching. I remember I was seven years old when I left. So although I experienced some of this stuff, like you know, in terms of standing in line, it's mostly like through stories from my parents, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I interviewed my parents and I said, like, what happened to our money? Like, what, what happened to our money when we left the Soviet Union? Did we get to keep our, our cash? Well, basically, first of all, nobody had a lot of money. Most people didn't have savings in the Soviet Union, which, which is understandable. But everyone had the same amount. Yeah. But the interesting thing is, like, we were actually able to exchange some of it for dollars, but it was for a specific amount, so $100 per person, and it was at a government exchange rate, okay? The government exchange rate, which was like 30 times worse than the actual true black market rate. So basically, we got to keep like none of our money and the rest of our money is completely worthless. And so when I heard about Bitcoin, it was like, oh, wait, this is a money. This is a new type of money. And it's the kind of money that nobody can control, right? Like the government cannot, first of all, they can't take it from you. They can't prevent you from leaving the country with it. And they can't print more of it. This is a big deal to prevent the next Soviet Union, right? Um, so that's that's kind of what what got me really interested in it. So um, you said something very interesting because um, uh, even as a kid, uh, you felt that this is wrong, right? And, and it, it, it's it's almost like um, um, the way I see it right now. You are a problem solver and educator. I mean, and and it kind of stemmed almost from your childhood, you know, and seeing all the wrong things. There is is that is there some truth to that? I, I think well, I mean, I, I don't think it would be fair to say that as a seven year old I knew there was something wrong. As a seven year old, this was my normal life. Like nobody in in the Soviet Union knew that standing in line for bread was wrong, because part of the reason was because information was very tightly controlled. Nobody knew what was beyond like mm. the wall, right? And this is like the experience that everybody every if you ask any immigrant uh, from the Soviet Union about what they remember about coming to America. They'll tell you they remember supermarkets. They they remember walking into their first Jewel, and, and I don't know if you have Jewel over there, but we have you know, Jewel or Dominix or Safeway, whatever. And like their mind was completely blown that there was abundance in the world because we we thought that it was normal to like there right. was like scarcity of everything, right? But you did <laughs> ask the question, what happened to to the money? And you know, like you you were already curious about about those things, right? For sure. I mean, so yeah, I asked that question uh, later, but yeah, I mean that's. That is that is the important thing to, to be asking about, right? And a lot of times, these people in these economies, they don't understand that they're being screwed so badly by their government. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the people of North Korea and Venezuela and our, even Argentina, like ten years ago, did the same shit to their people. And this, it's becoming harder and harder to, to hide uh, mm -hmm. because of the internet and because information is flowing uh, more freely now. And that gives me hope. But at the same time, as long as governments have the ability to control the economic situation of their people, this will continue to happen. This will continue to be abused. And this is why Bitcoin is so important. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. So you saw you. So basically you, you lived in Soviet union, uh, at, you know, as, as did I. Um, and, and then because the fish doesn't know it's wet, right? So exactly. you, you don't know where you live. You, everything is normal to you. And that's, that's how I felt. Uh, but then when that was over, you saw uh, something else, right? 
And when I was a kid, I was watching a lot of you know Hollywood Hollywood movies. Um, and what I saw there, it was like, oh wow, that's not the same as what's here. And so I want to be there, you know. So even as a kid, I felt like where I am right now is something wrong with it, and there is where I want to be. You know, I mean, a lot of kids yeah. felt that way. Like I, I only remember seeing two movies in Russia, and I think they were both sci-fi movies. Like one of them was uh, Short Circuit, and the other one was uh, Star Wars. And I'm wondering yeah. if the reason that those are the movies that made it over the border is because they're sci-fi and they have like nothing to do with reality. Because if yeah. they ever showed us a movie about what America was like, people would like lose their shit. <laughs> yeah, but but like the way we watch movies, obviously through like these um, you know copies, a little uh, you know these VHS yeah, like, tapes, and and it was just like underground, you know. Right, right. Uh, yeah, I was too young for the underground stuff. So like the stuff that I was exposed to was definitely like the sci-fi movies, which is really yeah. fun. But just but just but you get to experience the contrast once you once you um uh once you obviously experience america and 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 you know and then you can compare the soviet union versus america you can you say wow that's this that's a lot different there and um and and obviously it seems to me like you got a sense of what's right what's wrong and and, and it seems to me that like it, it kind of um it really made your your life mission didn't it I think, well, yeah, in the end, right, it took me a long time to come to this uh, because before Bitcoin, it wasn't like I was thinking about this. I wasn't, I mean, I, I gave the occasional thought to like how the Soviet Union is bad and like why free markets are good and why can't, I mean, growing up in America, you get drilled into like capitalism is good, uh, socialism is bad, right? Like you get drilled with this stuff and you think it's normal and that's fine. And there's nothing wrong with capitalism. We actually have a pretty good system here, probably the best in the world. But, um, what I'd like to point out is that what we have going on here actually is leading us towards a pretty dark path and we could end up being just as bad as anybody else, right? Everybody thinks America is safe because, you know, we're capitalists. We're never going to fall prey to this stuff. Uh, and I just don't think that's true. And we see it right now. It's happening, right? There's all these memes. Actually, one of the things yeah. that I, I thought was really oh, interesting. So, so there you go. You are, uh, you get to notice that, right? right. And you, you see what that. I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is that your childhood experiences, everything that happened in your past life, I mean, you know, this is what happened to me, made you see the world this way. I mean, you, not many people like yeah. you are. You, you do understand that, well, right? Like there, there yeah, are quite a few, but not a lot. Yeah. And I think that's why it's really hard to explain Bitcoin to Americans, frankly, because like you talk to an American and you're like, you know, Bitcoin, it's, it's uncensorable money. And they say eh, like, why? The dollar is fine. Uh, PayPal works, it's free. Like everything is just great. Um, and that's true. Like we live in a very good economy and like the dollar is very strong. We, it's like the world currency, right? And so there's a lot of ways, despite all the people who think like the, you know, the economy is going to crash tomorrow, which it very well may, like at the end of the day, America is still pretty much the world power on the stage. And so we get to live in very big privilege, right? We're, we are constantly in the privilege of being the world hegemon for, for currency. Uh, this is not the case for most of the world. Um, and they have a totally different experience. But uh, um, you would agree with me that things not as it seems, right? And, and, and I, I would agree, yeah. Right. So, I mean, we keep hearing, like, I don't know if you've noticed this, but, like, the word MMT keeps popping up more and more in my feed. Um, uh, modern monetary theory, this is, like, a new thing where basically people are pushing the idea that we should just spend as much money as we need to until we get full employment. And basically, mm -hmm. that's that's just socialism. That's, like, straight up saying, okay, we're just going to print as much money as necessary uh, mm -hmm. to make the economy fully employed and let's not like worry about the consequences because until we have full employment we haven't spent enough money and like mm -hmm. this is literally what what russia was doing they were giving jobs to everybody guaranteed jobs uh and that's great like the sound of a jobs guarantee on paper sounds amazing like everybody gets 15 dollars an hour fantastic right but i think that like all these things that are happening and also all the quantitative easing that's that's gone on i mean i'm not going to get too deep into economics because i'm not an economist um, and I'm sure people are going to like point that out and say that I'm wrong about this stuff. But here's the thing, right? Very intuitive. We all understand supply and demand, right? Everybody like understands the basics of supply and demand. When you have more of something, it loses its value. This is like basic stuff. But for some reason, we're taught that like once you layer on central banking and there's all these fancy words around it and there's all this these systems that all of a sudden these rules don't make, uh, they, they don't apply anymore. Like it's like quantum physics. Like now all of a sudden the Fed can quadruple the money supply and there's no inflation, right? But all of a sudden like healthcare costs them, you know, nobody can afford healthcare. Nobody can afford education. Like when they say there's no inflation, like, I mean, come on guys. <laughs> like, <Yeah. laughs> 
this right like everybody can be completely employed and we still can't afford shit that's a problem yeah. and that's, that's all right where we're headed but if, okay so deep on that one. yeah let's let's keep this for the for the last let's go into this uh, political and socio-economical um you know influence of bitcoin uh, you know for uh, for later now let's go uh, into the grids so to speak right so what problems did we have uh, in you know 2008 uh, you know market crash in in and uh, there's a lot of other um, sort of things that uh, that happened there which you know I don't want to get into it but everybody saw the things that they, it, they felt wrong and then the people felt angry at uh, something or someone uh, that uh, they were lied to you know they didn't really um, you know understand uh, uh, why this is happening and a lot of people just left angry. And then something happened as as a as a consequence of that, and 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 that is Bitcoin. They, they were these problems were addressed and resolved through the technology. And so I want to get into that now. I want to get into the what problems were there, and um, if you can just you know name these problems, uh, and we're gonna try to unravel each one and to understand how Bitcoin resolved these. Sure. Yeah. So I want to kind of give just a kind of a high level overview of what, what I think Bitcoin is, right? And then we can get into the individual uh, individual steps of how, you know, how Bitcoin might've come about. But if we look at some of Satoshi's, uh, you know, early writings and stuff that he posted when he was releasing Bitcoin, he, he called out a few things. One, he called out that uh, central banks were debasing currency. Uh, debasement meaning they are printing more and more of it, right? Like he says, we have to trust central banks. I think, let me find the quote. We have to trust the banks with our privacy. Trust uh, Central bank must be trusted not to debase the currency, but the history of fiat currencies is full of breaches of that trust. Okay, so what he was saying okay. is basically like banks uh, print currency at will. Again, in the United States, they're relatively responsible with this, so we don't see the effects. We've seen this play out in much different ways all over the world as well, right? So that's one of the things is like, the, the core design goal of, of Bitcoin is uh, the controlled supply. We have a specific supply that's known in advance. It's not going to be uh, willy-nilly adjusted by people, okay? Okay, so you just said something. You said the, the, the concept of trust and honesty, yes. right? Um, where the trust and honesty was necessary, where it, 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 it went corrupt, where exactly? So I think it, the the problem there is centralization of power, right? Once we give somebody the power to of the printing press, right, the, the power of of printing money, then that now becomes the a central point that could fail. And how does it fail? Well, it, like in a in a sort of honest economy, like you could say the United States is relatively not corrupt, right? Compared to like the Soviet Union or something where everybody was getting bribes left and right, we're definitely not there. But we do have lobbying, we do have all this stuff, right? So we have we have people that influence the money machine and, and steer that money, right? And because we have one central place where that happens, you naturally start to get centralized power, and then the centralized power just wants to maintain the status quo, and they do whatever they want with that with that uh, printing press. And that that becomes definitely a big problem. And so, it's exactly what happened in Venezuela, right? So, would you say that um, the 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 concept is sound? However, the the fact that we need to rely on humans for trust and honesty. That's where it fails. Is that correct? Yeah, I think absolutely that's right because humans are are not infallible. Even well-meaning humans, and like you'll notice that a lot of stuff that happens in history that's horrible happens for good reasons. Like you know, the people of the Soviet Union legitimately wanted to give everybody like equal, uh, you know, they wanted equality for all. They wanted everybody to have a meal on their table, right? Like that, that was a legitimately good thing they were trying to achieve. However, in order to achieve it, they centralized power. And the, and the centralized power abused the power that was given, right? That's exactly what happens with centralized power every time. Okay, so now let's say we have centralized power and then we trust uh, a, a group of people. Now, what happens if that fails? What is the consequence of that failing? Well, the consequence is society collapses. In the worst case, society collapses. Uh, you know, in the best- What does that mean? What does that mean to a regular person? What does it mean society collapse? What would it mean to a regular person if, if that happens? I mean, if you look, there's plenty of examples. The Soviet Union is one of them. Venezuela is another one of them, right? What happens is your money becomes completely worthless. You so are you saying that the U.S. can potentially face to what Venezuela um, has? 
I, I don't think so, but is it possible? Yes, it is certainly possible. It, the thing is it's possible because we've seen it everywhere in the world. I mean, the it's happened to, to lots and lots of places, and to think that the U.S. is somehow immune is, is probably a fairy tale. I mean, one so, reason why we're probably more likely immune is because we have a pretty decentralized sort of government, government right? We have these three branches that are supposed to keep each other in check. We technically have independence between our printing press, which is mm. the Fed, and the and the you know the Treasury Department. Technically, we have independence, but okay. if that independence is compromised. Who knows, right? All right. So it's very interesting what you said. Like I didn't see that way because you you're saying is that um, it works because it's semi decentralized. That's why U.S. is is might be doing much better than in a country like that's Russia. What I think is the case. Yeah, that's that's. I really think the U.S. has. The most unique government government structure that's truly decentralized. It truly doesn't. Well, I don't semi, know, semi, like, semi, semi truly decentralized. It. It's as decentralized yeah, as yeah, yeah. Semi it's been able to achieve so far, right? It doesn't mean it can't get better. Why we uh, want to talk about this? Wow, well, that, that that is a compliment to the United States. You know, it's it, it, see that's the thing is that um, we look at it and say, well, there's a lot of messed up things going on. But what you just said, they said like, well, that's the best what we have. You know, like yes, the the, the the America is about always like improving and progressing somewhere, and they had great ideas, but they were not perfect. They got corrupt, right. and you know now we have problems. But the idea of of that American woman, American you know concept of financial freedom and, and pursuit of of happiness is that is we're continuously improving, and I really think that's why you know something like Bitcoin is 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 probably the the most American thing that was ever invented. I completely Would you agree with that. I think it's it's a it's a tool for liberty, it's a tool for freedom, and like if you look at what our founding fathers wrote, the whole Constitution is framed around the idea of not allowing any one person, not even the president to give full unilateral authority, right? This is exactly what happens in, in other countries. The president or whoever it is, head of state, takes full unilateral authority, and then once that happens, that person can do whatever they want. And even again, if they do it for good reasons, eventually those good reasons get greased with money, and then you know they get a little bit fudged, right? And things, things start to move in a, in a bad direction. Um, so I do think this is an interesting evolution. I think if America properly embraces Bitcoin, then we will be the most powerful nation on earth, not because we will have the most money, but because we will be so resilient to being taken over by somebody with crazy ideas because mm -hmm. we have that decentralization. I really think that the idea that like government and money is married is like a weird historical accident that should never have happened, uh -huh. and we need to fix it. <laughs> yeah. Wow, like uh, this is huge. What what you're saying is is um, uh, me. Uh, some people may look at it, uh, you know, and listen to this and say, "Well, I was kind of angry, but now I see that, you know, maybe it's up to me to make sure that the the America lives to its, um, you know, uh, you know, original ideas and 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 uh, what uh, was always aiming for, right? So so maybe that corruption is just few bad apples. Maybe maybe. That's, you know, everyone would benefit from Bitcoin and maybe even the people who run the central banks, maybe the, even them. Yeah, so I mean, maybe we don't really have an enemy. Where, I mean, we can touch upon, on this later, but I think there's definitely a world where banking can continue to be banking. It's just like if you're lending, you know, uh, if you're lending IOUs that are backed with Bitcoin, that's that's still banking. You can still make your money, still make money with your margins. Um, but, you know, like we've we've made money like the lifeblood of this of this like world power you know structure that we have and we just you know if we want to if we want more us dollars we just print more and the rest of the world suffers like that's, right, right. that's again we're in a position of privilege we, we don't feel a lot of the effects of what we do um mm -hmm. but um, this is why bitcoin is interesting i think uh, yeah, I, I mean, like, obviously, we, we're not going to go and, and debate into the, the like, what is, um, you know, exactly wrong with it, because it's kind of very deep subject, and it's, it's going to go a little bit off the tangent. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but the summary is, is that basically, um, capitalism is proven to work and it's it's you know the 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 best thing that we can have is protected capitalism and protected non-corrupt competence-based capitalism that's what we essentially striving for and, and and bitcoin is a is a huge part of that now uh what what we did have was that um capitalism was a great idea but there's few bad ideas that were kind of good ideas but they didn't account for the corruption of the human, uh, you know, you know, tendencies, right? And right. 
they were good ideas, but they just went back. And, and now we'll, we can look back and say, okay, well, that was a good experiment. We saw that it didn't, it didn't work out. What can we do about it? About it? And then I think that's when Satoshi came in and he came with the solution. So let's let's go into in, into this uh, for you know for a little bit. And what were the ideas at the very beginning to resolve this big problem? I mean, we're talking about the the the, the big scale, the 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 the, the, the pro progress of humanity type of problems, right? And, and would you agree with me? Right. Yeah. Right. So as I was saying, like I think the the uninflatability of the supply was one of the things that was super important because he didn't want banks to be uh, debasing that supply of governments um the other thing that i think is really important that he didn't really talk about directly but is a consequence of of bitcoin being created is that it's basically something that is very difficult to confiscate it's difficult to take bitcoin away from you because it's so portable right like you can carry bitcoin in your head and i think that's another reason why uh it becomes a sort of check on on bad actors and, and you know autocrats and, and bad government because uh, a lot of the ways that like why we weren't able to to leave the Soviet Union is because we couldn't take our money really like right right, right. Was, was in these rubles which is basically a, a worthless currency um, all right if we had Bitcoin you know we could definitely have, have just walked out with that Bitcoin in our heads and nobody could stop us so assuming right. we didn't get out. <laughs> but for people listening they may have a, a question it's like well how what kind of problems we we did have and what kind of problems Bitcoin resolved? Right, like so. So it's, it's sort of a um, you know a, a honest uh, a question, and I like the way you wrote the, in your book. Um, you broke it down into different problems, and you went over each problem like a story, and that's why it reads a little bit like a story. As is, you you can kind of get a sense of like this entity, uh, you know, evolving as it goes. So uh, why don't you talk about a um, few problems that we had to resolve? Definitely. So I, I think. Um... You know, the way that I think about, uh, the, the way that I wrote the book was thinking about as if I had to invent Bitcoin, right? So first thinking about, okay, well, this is what Bitcoin is. And now what are we trying to solve? Well, the first problem that we're really trying to solve is we, we want to remove the middleman, right? We just said that anytime we have a middle, like an entity in the middle, that entity tends to concentrate power, right? Whether it's the power we give to the government for printing money or whether it's even something like, we already have money, we need to send it to somebody else, it has to go through some intermediary, right? Like back in the day, I had a dollar bill or a gold coin or something, I could come to you and I could give it to you and I could buy an apple from you, right? That was peer-to-peer -peer money. But nowadays, most of our money is not peer-to-peer, -peer. most of it is digital money, right? And so once you have digital money, uh, that money by definition has to be transacted by some middleman, whether it's a bank or somebody like PayPal or you know, Apple Pay or like in China, they have WeChat, right, or Alipay. These are all systems that enable us to transact digital bits. The reason these systems need to exist is because there is no way, prior to Bitcoin, there was no way for us to ensure that um, there was digital scarcity. And so uh, we had to have somebody in the middle watching every transaction, making sure that it's it's okay and that it's it's allowed, right? So kind of the first problem that we want to tackle with Bitcoin is, we have a central system, we have a bank. How do we actually split it up and decentralize it, remove that middleman, right? So if you think about it, um, what is a bank, right? What, and when I say bank, it could be PayPal or Apple Pay, any of those things, right? Any, any digital system for, for storing value, all it is is a database, okay? It's a, it's a ledger of accounts. And in that database, it says, you know, Alice owns $5. Right. They have guards, they have uh, intrusion detection systems on their, on their database, nobody can mess with it. They have like third party audits so that we know that they're correct and honest in their process, right? This is how we currently have the system and it's based on trusting that middleman. Right. So we're going to try to break that apart. That's, that's the first problem. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, you described that there's a problem of middleman. And uh, what is the problem of, of middleman? So the problem is, as I described, that, that the middleman can essentially censor your transactions uh, and for, from the regular point of view uh or, you know from the regular person like um presumably uh, the middleman can charge me for using it right sure. but i think that's probably fair i don't think that's a big problem per se but you know if they're okay. doing some valuable service uh, mm -hmm. i think the biggest bigger issue is like 
uh, again, this kind of goes back to how, how far do you trust your government? How far do you trust your middleman? So in the United States, I trust my government a fair amount. I trust my banks a lot. Uh, they're like insured, blah, 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 right? Like when I send money on PayPal or through like Chase, I, I don't give it a second thought. I know it's gonna get to the other side. And I know that if it doesn't, that I can sue somebody or file a support ticket or something. There's there's recourse, right? Because we have a pretty good, um, a pretty good system here that that's largely functional. That's not really the case in like a lot of parts of the world. But 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 is it really? Because um, uh, you know, I personally have a, a lot of bad experience with PayPal where the the money was frozen, taken. Oh, I mean, yeah, it happened to me too. I had a two week freeze on my PayPal account. Couldn't like yeah, two thousand dollars in there I couldn't access. Yeah, uh, exactly. So <laughs> so if you if that's your money, how come you lose the control of it? That's that's what is just. Um, is very frustrating i mean like as for the user it is probably might be when you lose control over something that you work for it might be one of the most stressful things and a lot of people yeah. experience a lot of stress because of that i agree and i think it's probably worse with third-party services like paypal versus somebody that's more like established like a bank like i don't anticipate that tomorrow i'm going to log in and my chase account will be frozen however um let's say the united states thinks bitcoin is bad they notice i wrote a bitcoin book they decide, oh, let's just shut down everybody's bank accounts that's talked about Bitcoin. Like, they could do that. I don't think it's going to happen. I think that would be a huge constitutional crisis if they did that. But right, right. they could do that, right? And I think in a lot of other more authoritarian countries, this does happen. Like, if you're a political dissident and, and they don't want to hear from you, like, boom, lose access to your bank account. You're done. WikiLeaks, cut off. Like, you know, you, we don't like you. You can't do business anymore. And, uh, you know, it's also international. Like, United States does this to countries, right? Like, entire countries have been shut out. Of the banking industry like uh iran okay you can't transact with us dollars anymore see you later right okay. like and we're doing this to punish their government but their people are suffering and they're just regular people like us right mm -hmm. so this this is more it's the reason i say these things is because it's harder for an american to feel that problem that like that pain point like oh yeah i lost access to two thousand dollars in paypal oh no you know i'm gonna cry about it but for other people it's like life or death like you're saying it's like their money their hard-earned money they're shut out from it um, and we've seen instances where the government will like stop the ATM machines from like in Greece this happened, right? There's a bank run. Okay, you can't access the ATM machine or you can withdraw 30 euros a day. Good luck. Like these things happen, right? And this is where you now you realize you don't have control of your money. It's not your money anymore. Okay, so you said that uh, you don't have control of your money. It's not your money. And then um, also uh, the, um, the institution that does have a control of your money will push the boundaries to see how much it can abuse. Yeah, and again, sometimes it doesn't have to be malicious, right? Like a lot of times, I think if you if you follow some, it, it's, more, it's profit, it's profit, it's profit incentivized. So it could of be profit incentivized. It could be for the safety of the people, right? Like for example, like in Greece when they had the, their bank runs, you know, they didn't shut down ATMs because they wanted to punish people. They shut them down because they were afraid of the whole uh, banking system collapsing. So they were trying to like save their country. So they were acting rationally as the government would do. But the result is that people got hurt, right? Like people couldn't right. get access to their money. They couldn't pay their bills. They couldn't buy food. That is a problem, right? Um, and as we digitize more and more of our payments, we now are in a world where the majority of our payments are actually going through the central intermediaries, making it much easier for them to control these things. And we've seen like in China, they're doing a credit system where they're going to watch, you know, if you're smoking on a train, they're going to prevent you from buying train tickets. Like this is the kind of stuff that happens when oh, you yeah, yeah, have yeah. digital control over, uh, <laughs> over your society. That's not a place we want to be you're you're talking about a um a pretty much a a credit system uh of um like um how do you describe it i think they're calling it a social credit system yeah it's basically yeah. a a karma credit right yeah a karma yeah but but i shouldn't worry the i shouldn't use the word karma because it's a, it, yeah it's a corruption of the word karma for sure yeah. <laughs> but yeah i mean it's it's it, like we are going to digital payments, right? There's no doubt about any, like if you talk to anybody, I mean, if you look at China, they're so digital, they're way more digital than us. Like yeah. most of their payments are digital. So that's where the world's going. So we're gonna have to decide, do we want digital payments through a middleman or do we want digital payments that we have full control over the money? And that's that's the first problem that Bitcoin needs to solve. Okay, so that was the first problem. And there were quite a few um, actors uh, trying to resolve this problem at the beginning right and uh, we know bitcoin but they weren't just bitcoin yeah i mean the there were proposals for doing bitcoin like systems um and i think there was like the one that i'm most familiar with that was actually a functioning thing was called digicash 
uh, which was done in the like late 80s, early 90s. But the problem there was they were trying to make a system for money that was sort of separate from the from the United States, which is fine, but it was still a centralized, um, like a centralized entity. It was a, it was a company, okay? And so if a company goes out of business and they are the ones that control their money, your money, that's that's not a good situation. So yeah. I think when you whenever you centralize that control, um, you have the problems of it could go out of business, it could be hacked. Uh, the people who run the thing could make off with it. You know, there's there's all these problems. Mm -hmm. You can't really build a global monetary system on something that is essentially like one actor. And this that was the, the fundamental, uh, I think, innovation of Bitcoin. Uh, okay, there was a bunch of proposals. You know, B money and and so on. There's a lot of ideas about how to do this, but nobody could quite put together all the pieces correctly until Satoshi figured it out. Mm -hmm. Right. So we had uh, uh, um, people were trying to resolve these problems for quite a while, but uh, Satoshi made it. And um, so the, he resolved the first problem of uh, a problem of a middleman and the honesty, right, which is the second problem, which is how do we keep the ledger honest? Mm -hmm. And uh, now we had the challenge of how do, how are we going to keep the humans honest? Right. That's a big, big problem. Right. How do we keep the humans honest? And you know, can we do? Can we use other humans to keep the humans honest? Like right. maybe, but then we're doing the same thing, right? We're keeping the humans um, relying on humans. At any point, if you rely on human, you will run into this problem of honesty because humans are um, naturally corruptible. So we had the problem. We had the challenge of how we are going to uh, make humans accountable. And then, then then by definition, we had to come up with some sort of protocol that is not human entity that can keep the humans accountable, right? And that was the, that was the first uh, step into this. And then therefore we had to come up with that protocol and, and the you know com computer based protocol. And yeah. uh, why don't you tell us about um, you know how how Satoshi went about resolving the the incent incentivizing honesty in people with his protocol definitely so basically let's let's just jump back a little bit into the, the decentralizing ledger idea so we talked about a bank we have a bank it's got a ledger of accounts that says how much every person owns and then when the person wants to send money to another person that bank is just moving bits in their database right so the first idea of Bitcoin is like we're going to take that ledger and we're not going to put it in one place we're going to get give it to everybody okay so a bunch of computers are going to have a copy of that ledger and now I will write down how much you know you own, and you will write down how much you own. Everybody's going to have a copy. Now this is a good system because we no longer have one central point where where that transaction has to happen. So now instead of calling the bank when I want to send my money, I actually have to go and tell everybody on the network. Network being just a connection between computers, right? We can imagine it as like text messages or a phone call or something like that. So everybody has a copy of the ledger. Now, if I say, okay, I'm sending $5 to Bob and I call up everybody in the network and I tell them, please change your ledger to reflect this new transaction, uh, the problem becomes how do I know that people are going to do it uh, and not going to write down something completely different. Uh, now, if it's a system of friends, like let's say this is just a system between you and me and we decide to like keep a ledger of accounts, I know you pretty well, like we, we can trust each other and that's fine. But if we want to scale this to a global system and we want to say that anybody can participate, then we have a problem because we don't know the people involved, right? So a couple of ideas around this were tried, and, and a lot of this is actually what is now being called proof of stake. If you hear the word proof of stake, it's actually not a new idea. It's actually an old idea. And the idea is like, we're, we're going to trust some people, okay? We're going to trust a few uh, specific people on the network to be the people who write these transactions, okay? So instead of calling everybody, I'm just going to call my friends, Alice and Bob, and I'm going to tell them about these transactions. And that's fine. Uh, and then everybody else is going to get a copy of those transactions from Alice and Bob, as long as Alice and Bob are trusted people. But again, remember, this is a system where we can't, like you said, we can't rely on humans. Part of the reason is humans are corruptible. And we don't know if Alice and Bob have been uh, put a gun to their head or if they've been paid off to do something bad, right? And again, we're building a new form of money here that, that we don't want anybody to really have any influence over. So the idea of selecting specific people for, for keeping this ledger is a bad idea because those okay. people are comfortable, right? Um, and so, okay, so, that, so, that, so that goes out the window. Uh, next. Right. <laughs> so, so next we can try to do something like, uh, you know, this is now another idea that's floating out there. A lot of crypto coins do this. It's called delegated proof of stake. We're going to vote for the people who get to keep the, uh, to that ledger, right? So like, let's say 
instead of Alice and Bob, we just have a pool of like a thousand people and every day we're gonna vote for somebody new who gets to be the person who gets to write to the ledger. But it's the same exact problem, right? Like all of these voting systems can be coerced. You can always find all the people involved. You can always, you know, uh, threaten them with violence or, or give them money or something to, to mess up the system. So basically what this uh, brings, um, where this guides us is that we have to have a system where absolutely anybody in the world can play and, and, can, and can become uh, an authority and can become somebody who writes to this ledger, right? Uh, if anybody at all can, can be selected, then the pool of people that, that could be coerced is basically, you know, it's impossible to, to control. And every time it's going to be a different person. But if that's the case, right, that we no longer have any element of, of centralized trust. Like we can't, we can't have somebody sitting there and saying, okay, today it's gonna be Jan and tomorrow it's gonna be Kastutis. We can't choose people. We can't have anybody that we trust to do that. So how do we choose who gets the right to the ledger? Um, this is where we get the idea of holding a lottery. Okay. So the idea of Bitcoin is like this. We're going to hold a lottery. Anybody in the world can play the lottery. And if they win the lottery, then they get to do two things. One, they get to write the transactions that want to happen into the ledger. And two, they get to win some money for playing the lottery, right? Because they get compensated for their work. Okay, uh, yeah. so, uh, so I want to uh, stress this, this thing because I think this is the crucial point is that what you just said is that like if you win the lottery, you you get to say what is true in the ledger and you get if you and if it is true, you get rewarded uh, with Bitcoin in this case. Is that yeah. correct? That is correct. Okay, so what what you just described is something. How are we going to incentivize honesty through the protocol? And um, this specific case is uh, this specific uh, you know the resolution of this problem makes a person who participating in the network incentivized for honesty. And we never had this thing before. Right. And this is the first time we, we had it. So I think um, anybody who's listening to this and trying to understand Bitcoin is is that that. Uh, this protocol is incentivizing humans for honesty to keep the ledger safe and therefore resolving the problem of dishonest ledgers. They're, they're being incentivized. Uh, the reason they're being incentivized is because Bitcoin is a system based on consensus. Okay, Consensus means everybody has to agree. So what happens is somebody plays the lottery, and we'll talk about what it is, what it means to play the lottery. Somebody plays the lottery, they, roll, they basically buy a lottery ticket, they play the lottery. If they win the lottery, then they win the right to enter new transactions into the ledger. Now, if the transactions that they write into the ledger are independently verified by everybody else to be correct, then that person will also be able to grant themselves a special ledger entry that says they have a, a new reward. But okay. if they so, don't, <laughs> yeah. So, so, it, so it's a combination of a protocol and, and human incentives. So, what you're saying is there is a consensus, and then if that person is lying is not only uh, uh, I mean uh, not only other people can verify if that was true but also that person is losing the reward correct yes they're losing the reward and so um, the idea of this lottery the, so there's no there's no winning you can't lie right Otherwise, okay the, the problem the problem with holding a lottery like this right because you now we've been talking about a lottery but like a normal lottery it has a central administrative party, right? Like if you look at Powerball or something like that, where people are creating numbers, people are buying lottery tickets from some central authority that, that issues those lottery tickets. And then that central authority tells everybody what the winning combination is and then whoever has the ticket wins, right? Now, in order to make this lottery possible, this is kind of one of the big innovations of Bitcoin. And it's technically not Bitcoin's innovation. It was, it was um, a thing called proof of work and it comes from an earlier innovation called Hashcash. But the idea is, we need to make people, uh, we need to make those lottery tickets expensive, okay? Because if if it's free to play the lottery, let's say we make the lottery totally free to play, right? Then that means that producing new Bitcoin is completely free. If producing it is free, then people are just going to produce as much of it as they want. And if that's the case, then it's worth nothing, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to have strict control over the production of Bitcoin. And this idea of proof of work, basically what it means is that we allow people to buy a lottery ticket, not from a central authority, but from the universe. And we do it with the laws of physics. The way that the laws of physics tell us about energy is that energy is not free. Okay? You cannot create energy out of thin air. That's the first law of thermodynamics, basically. So the idea of this is like, we're going to 
buy a lottery ticket. And the way that we're going to buy that lottery ticket is by burning a certain amount of energy. Perfect. Okay. And everybody else, once, once we buy that lottery ticket, everybody else is going to be able to validate that we actually burn that amount of energy. That's kind of the magic behind what makes Bitcoin mining work. It's a, it's a lottery ticket that you, you spend energy to buy as many tickets as you want. Proportional, the more energy you spend, meaning the more dollars you spend, the more lottery tickets you get. And if you win, everybody can validate that you've, that you've won. Okay, so you, you just said something very important is that not only this concept is keeping the ledger honest, but it also, in order to get the reward, there's, it has to be costly. So therefore, it resolves another problem, which is uh, printable uh, currency. Right, so it makes this yes. unprintable at the same time as keeping it honest. And this it, is what it doesn't make it unprintable. It makes it costly to produce, which is to say, not free. Right. Um, basically, it's like we we don't want it to be free because then it will have no value because anybody can do it. So right. what we're trying to say is we want to produce this these lottery tickets. We want to make them cost something, some non-zero amount, and we'll talk about how that works in a, in a second. Um, right. So, so what I'm trying to do is like for the listeners to understand like what what problems were resolved. The problem uh, with with this protocol, we resolved. Uh, we made a, a, a lying to be uh, punishable, and then uh, uh, honesty rewarded. And at the same time, because we do have the concept, such the concept as a reward, uh, we made uh, that uh, playing of the lottery costly, and the the reward that you get which means you know a producing of that currency costly meaning that it will in comparison to any other currency that does not cost to produce it will have the value over that so we're resolving the problem of somebody pressing the button and making more of the currency like in in terms of the dollar we just like you know just keep raising the debt ceiling and keep printing more money so right. this this result you know, this solution was so elegant and, and I think so important that it resolved uh, both of these problems with one, uh, you know, protocol. Yeah, and that's actually what makes it a little bit challenging to explain because it's not solving just one problem. You're, you're making it hard to cheat because you're basically punishing people because in order to produce, you know, let's say $10,000 worth of Bitcoin, they have to also spend almost $10,000 worth of electricity. We'll explain why that's the case in a second. But that's the, the punishment reward thing there is the idea that you burn that much electricity. You will make some Bitcoin, you will make some marginal uh, amount. But if you cheat, if you do something that everybody else believes is wrong, then you will lose, you will not get your reward, but you will have already burned that energy. You will already have spent that money and you still owe your electricity company money. So you better do the right thing when you mine. You better play by the rules. And if you play by the rules, you get rewarded. If you don't, you lose the, the energy, which is meaning the money that you've put into mining and, and that's lost forever. Okay, so at this point we resolved those big problems that um, leads to uh, inflation and then leads to corruption. Um, so now we have a, a, a big problems resolved. Uh, what are the next problems? Um, well, I, I wanna get a little bit into, um, a little deeper into mining for a second because I think in order to understand, this is something that trips up a lot of people when I talk to them about how mining works is, they say, okay, well, you're saying there's a lottery, but in a lottery, there's a winning number. So somebody must know the winning number. Otherwise, how would they, how would they know? Okay. Um, so I want to just talk about that briefly and see if we can do it without slides, which is a little tricky. Um, the idea of, of Bitcoin mining is you're, it's a random process. You're basically rolling a die, okay? Um, you're, you're taking this roll of the die and you're combining it with a certain input. Input meaning like some data you want to write to the ledger. Okay, so let's say I want to send five bitcoins to Custodus. I'm going to say, hey everybody, I want to send five bitcoins to Custodus. All the miners are going to take that transaction where where I'm sending five bitcoins to him, and they're going to mine it. Which is to say, they're going to take that data and they're going to roll a random die, and they're going to uh, smush it together in a special mathematical thing called a hash function. Okay, that produces just a giant number. Okay, so basically everybody is rolling the die, producing a really, really giant number over and over and over and over. Now this number, the possibilities of this number are as many as there are atoms in the universe. It's like inconceivably giant, okay? It's, it's like a one with 77 zeros behind it. It's huge. So try not to have your mind completely blown here. <laughs> Everybody's rolling the die, producing these really, really giant numbers. Now, ahead of time, 
everybody on the network has agreed that there's a specific range of, of outcomes that we will consider a winning number, okay? And this is called a target. So let's say number of possibilities from zero to as many as there are atoms in the universe. We've all agreed that only numbers that are below 1 million are going to be valid. So what are all the miners doing? They're taking that transaction data, they're rolling a random number, and they're trying to produce one of these giant numbers, and they're landing somewhere on this number line, somewhere between zero and the number of atoms in the universe, and they're trying to get into the little space between zero and a million. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, like 99.999% or whatever of the time, they're not going to get in there. They're not going to get the right number. Mm -hmm. This is where they've burned some energy. So they're going to do it again, and they're going to burn some energy, and they're going to do it again. And they might have to do this millions of times or billions of times, and they have special computers called ASICs, application-specific integrated circuits, special computers called mining machines or ASICs. They're basically, all they're doing is they're just doing this random process, okay? So if you read in the media that Bitcoin is about solving complex equations, that is false. Bitcoin is not about solving complex equations. The equation is very, very simple. What it is about is a random process of rolling the die over and over and over, forcing you to burn that energy, forcing you to find a number that's within the space. Now, if you are lucky and you land within this little space between zero and a million, then you can say, hey, everybody, I found the winning number and here's how I did it. Here's the input data. Jan wants to send five Bitcoin to students. That's your input data. Here's the random number I attached to that data. Here's how I smushed them together. And here's the giant, giant number I got that landed in that little space. So you basically offer a proof. This is called a cryptographic proof. You're offering proof that you've done this sort of a math function that you've done this guessing that you've yes. done the, the you ran these millions billions of operations yeah. the, in order to land in that fraction of the percentile of all the possible outcomes right and because that and space you, is so so tiny the probability that you could land in there on your first try is so so small that you basically like by by statistical proof you had to have computed that many you had to have spent that much electricity to to actually produce that number that's that is what Bitcoin mining is in a nutshell. It's landing in that little space on a pre-agreed upon interval that everybody in the network can check independently. And once so, you tell so, them how you did it, they can check it in an instance and they know for sure that, you, that you've done the work. So, so for somebody who um, you know had some experience at, like you know hacking the passwords, this is a little bit like um, a brute forcing the, yeah. the, the, the password. It's exactly like trying to guess somebody's password, except for the password is not 10 characters long. It is uh, one with 77 zeros characters long. So yeah. that's how big of a space you're trying to get through. So basically, there's no way to do it. Um, in fact, there's a really great Reddit post where somebody summarizes that basically, like, you would have to have, I don't know, like a gazillion suns of energy with, like, you know, a quintillion Earths worth of atoms. If each atom was to store one bit of information, like it, it would take you still like an, um, the age of the universe to find that number. So basically it's impossible. And this is the really cool thing about Bitcoin. It's secured by physics and math. Like there's nothing better. We know that these things hold true. We have proofs for them. And this is, this is really, really cool because you can't have somebody comes along and says, oh, I, you know, I cheated. Here's my Bitcoin. Give me some Bitcoin. No, you have to prove that you burned that money. Or that you burned that uh, US dollars through, through or whatever your currency is through mining that you landed in that space. So uh, you would say that uh, Bitcoin is backed by physics and math? I would absolutely say Bitcoin is backed by physics and math. Yeah, I mean, actually, I think Trace Mayer says this a lot, uh, where he's like, you know, the gold is backed by chemistry, right? Like, how do you know a piece of gold is genuine? Well, because mm -hmm. chemical properties, we know we can't synthesize gold. We, we have to dig it up, and you can do a test. Well, Bitcoin is backed by physics and math. If you show me that transactional data, that random number, how you smush them together, I can 100% say that this Bitcoin is not counterfeit. It's completely not counterfeitable. And this is very, very cool because the US dollars and gold both get counterfeited all the time, even though they're supposedly good tests for, for their uh, authenticity. So for, for, for any listeners, um, uh, I think you this specific concept that Jan explained, uh, try to understand that um, dollar it doesn't require any value uh, to be produced. Bitcoin does require a lot of uh, value, which is time and energy. And you do your own thinking, you do your own comparison, Bitcoin versus dollar, and you do your own conclusions on that, on, on this respect. Okay, so the next one, because these are the amazing resolutions to the problems that we had, you know, so far, but that we're not, we're not done yet. 
we have a, 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 another problem is in that is, is how do we keep from somebody coming up with a, a massive, uh, you know, uh, mining power and just mining all the bitcoins, you know, very quickly. Yeah, uh, definitely. So uh, this is one of the most, this is actually, I think, the core innovation of, of Bitcoin, uh, because the thing that we just talked about, which is called proof of work, which is the idea that you can hash some random numbers and produce uh, things within a range that was actually uh, invented before. And that was by Adam Beck was now uh, leading Blockstream. So a very smart guy. Um, but the core innovation of Bitcoin was, well, okay, great. Everybody can do this. So we, we said it's a permissionless system. Anybody can join and start mining. Okay. So now the price of Bitcoin is, is going up and people are really excited and everybody's going to start mining. Everybody is going to start uh, wanting to produce Bitcoin. Well, what problem does that solve? The, the cause? Well, if everybody starts mining, right? And we remember we said mining is a random process where we're throwing a random sort of darts on this number line and we're trying to land into the space. Okay. Now, if we have 10 times as many people mining or 100 times as many or 1,000 times as many, we're basically making it more likely that somebody's going to hit that space and they're going to win that Bitcoin. So imagine if we're producing like, I'm just going to make up numbers, but let's say we're producing one Bitcoin uh, per second and all of a sudden, you know, with one, with one person mining and now all of a sudden 100 people are mining. Well, that means we're going to produce 100 Bitcoins per second, right? And that's a big problem. Uh, that, that's a problem because... One of the core design goals of, of Bitcoin, again, remember Satoshi did not like the idea that banks were debasing money. One of the core designs was Bitcoin has to have a completely predictable supply curve. We know exactly how much Bitcoin will be produced. And the way that, that uh, Satoshi designed it was a logarithmic curve. It looks like this. Hopefully this is coming through on my screen. I'm drawing it. Um, it starts out fast and then it tapers off and gets really, really, really slow. And it takes all the way up to around the year 2140 to produce all of the Bitcoins. That's the design. So how do we keep honest to that design? How do we prevent a, an influx of miners from uh, overproducing Bitcoin? Because again, if we produce too much, we have oversupply, we have inflation, because that means people will start selling it at low prices. Okay, is that is that is the question clear? They formulate that? Yes, question? yes. Um, uh, you know, so if somebody comes along and has a lot of mining power, um, the code would not let them to mine faster than 10, min uh, 10, uh, 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 10 minutes per block. Exactly. Is that correct? That is correct. So how do we do? Yeah. And the design of Bitcoin specifically is, yeah, it, every 10 minutes, a block is produced. We'll talk about what blocks are in a second. But essentially, every 10 minutes, a certain amount of Bitcoin is produced. Currently, and it's 10 minutes on average. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less because it's a random process. Um, okay. So today, so that, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say that today, the block reward today is 12 and a half Bitcoin. So every time, if you are one of those lucky people that lands in that little space of mining those hashes, you win 12 and a half Bitcoins for doing that. Mm -hmm. That's a fair amount of money. I think at today's price is like 70 some thousand dollars. So you, yeah. you win 12 and a half Bitcoins for keeping the ledger honest. Yes. Yes, exactly. Uh, well, again, we'll talk about why, why you're keeping it honest in a second. But uh, we said that you're doing this game because you want to win Bitcoin and, and you want to win Bitcoin by, by writing transactions that are correct so that everybody else can validate it. Mm -hmm. um, so how do, we, how do we make sure that you're not mining too fast by, by having an influx of miners? So uh, Bitcoin has a concept of difficulty. Okay? Difficulty is how hard is it to produce Bitcoin. How many times am I going to have to throw darts at this thing? How many times am I going to have to roll that die to land in that spot? Okay. Mm -hmm. And the way that it works is remember we said we have this number line and we're trying to get a number between zero and as many as there are atoms in the universe. And I said arbitrarily that our target is going to be 1 million. Now when Bitcoin launched, it had a preset target inside of it. The target was some, some large number. And the first miner, which was Satoshi, he actually had to mine. He didn't like give himself Bitcoins for free. He actually had to run his computer until he hit a random number within that space. And when he did, he established uh, the first block. Okay, He won the first block reward, which was at that time 50 Bitcoins. Remember we said the Bitcoin reward tapers off. It gets less and less over time. It was 50 Bitcoins, then it was 25, then it was 12 and a half, and soon it will be six and a quarter and so on. Mm -hmm. It keeps dropping every four years. And so how does that get enforced, right? So Satoshi mined his block, and then somebody else joined the network, and now there's two miners, and there's two computers doing the same thing. And so now they were mining Bitcoin twice as fast, and then there was four computers, and they were mining four times as fast, and there was 10 times as many, and so on, right? They kept getting faster and faster and faster, and pretty soon they were producing Bitcoin faster than 10 minutes apart, which is a violation of the protocol. 
And so what Bitcoin does, it has a very clever thing called a difficulty adjustment. And what it does is it says, let's take a look at the prior 2016 blocks. What is the, what is the history for the, it's about two weeks. What happened in the last two weeks? Were we going too fast or too slow? And if we were going too fast, there was too many miners who were producing blocks too quickly, then we are all going to recalculate a new number. Remember we said that number was a million. Now all of a sudden, we're going too fast. We're going to cut it in half. We're going to bring it down to 500,000. We just made the space of winning hashes much smaller. By doing that, we're now saying people have to try twice as hard. We've increased the difficulty twice as much. So people have to spend twice as much energy mining. So if the number of miners doubles, the difficulty adjusts to make it twice as hard to mine, making it therefore just they have to expend twice as much energy. And when that happens, that basically compensates for new miners coming in because uh, it, instead of, you know, if Bitcoin is being produced every 10 minutes and all of a sudden too many miners come in and it's being produced every five minutes, then the difficulty adjustment brings us back to that 10 minute interval because it makes it twice as hard to mine. So we have twice as hard to mine with twice as many miners who are canceling that out or back to a one to one ratio. Okay, so as the, the, the rate of mining increases, uh, what happens, the code automatically improves that uh, slice of possible guesses by a little more, and it makes it so much more difficult. Yes, the more miners join, the more difficult it gets, and vice versa. If miners, so what happens is, you know, people are mining, let's say Bitcoin costs $1,000, and you can currently spend $500 of electricity and earn $1,000 with the Bitcoin. Oh, that's a great deal. Everybody's going to start mining, right? Mm -hmm. Now, what happens is the difficulty adjustment makes it so that if, if more miners join, it becomes more difficult. To, eventually, instead of spending $500 on electricity, they have to spend $1,000. And if enough miners join, all of a sudden, they have to spend $2,000. Mm -hmm. Now, they're spending more money on electricity than Bitcoin is worth. They're losing money. So what is the rational thing to do if you're losing money? It's to turn off your mining machine, okay? Not burn that electricity. So Bitcoin basically adjusts both ways. If too many people are mining, then too much Bitcoin is produced. We increase the difficulty, we make it more difficult to mine. They spend more money. They at some point become unprofitable. They go out of business or they turn off their miners temporarily or whatever. They go off the network. Now, Bitcoin is again easy to produce. There's, or sorry, it's still difficult to produce, but now there's few miners. So now it's going too slowly. Mm -hmm. The problem in reverse, we actually going to increase that threshold make that space of winning hashes bigger, which means that it's easier to mine, which means you spend less money mining and now all, all of a sudden some people are profitable again. So every two weeks there's literally some people that become profitable, some people that go that become less profitable and this adjusts all the time to make sure that we're at equilibrium, we're always producing blocks roughly every 10 minutes. Okay, so Jan explained to you guys um, like from the technical point of view of like what is going on. Now the consequence of that is that it keeps uh, humans predictable. Right, in, 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 in that's another thing. So we, we resolved the problem of honesty. Now this result uh, uh, of predictability. Now because the sound money requires such thing as predictability, and um, uh, you know Satoshi uh, uh, resolved this problem as well. So as you can see, guys, we have like three problems resolved that uh, that were like massive, massive in in terms of of like uh, uh, its accomplishment of keeping humans accountable. To the protocol, and you know, and we're gonna go into this a little bit later, but uh, I hope you understand the scope of it, and I hope you understand why when people get into Bitcoin and when they do understand that they go a little bit, uh, you know, maniac on it. <laughs> it's completely nuts. I mean, the the invention is is very profound, and I think um, one thing that you you pointed out is very very important is that uh, we this property of predictability of supply does not exist in nature. It it cannot exist in nature. Okay. Take anything you think is really, really hard to produce. Let's say gold, okay? Gold is pretty hard to produce. It's expensive to produce. But guess what? If tomorrow an asteroid shows up from space and has 10 times the amount of gold on it than we have on Earth, the value of our gold goes to zero or, or you know, a tenth of the current price, right? There's no... Um, there's no... It becomes plenty. Yeah, there's no hardness of any natural element because we know that it exists somewhere else, right? And, and as, as long as it's profitable to do so, we can go out and mine it and produce it and so on. So um, that's even besides the point because most of our money these days isn't even gold. It's really just governments printing it willy nilly. So that's for sure not predictable because uh, you know you your guess is as good as mine as what the Fed's going to do next next quarter. But uh, that's 
you know, and, and the Fed is pretty predictable. I mean, let's talk about like, you know, uh, Maduro in Venezuela. Like, we don't know what he's going to do. He's got the money printing button right under his finger. So yeah. that's the, the thing about Bitcoin is it's the first asset that we know. The first thing known to humanity is completely predictable supply schedule. With, you know, within variance, like from week to week, sure. But realistically speaking, there's no variability. We know exactly where we're going to be like 100 years from now. And that is completely mind blowing. And if that's not mind blowing, then rewatch this video and understand it because it is mind blowing. Yeah, it, it is mind blowing. I mean, um, it, it's, it's mind blowing in, in so many ways. I mean, like, you know, five years from now, I'll wake up in the morning and the Bitcoin will be mine at 10 minutes per block. You know, it's, it's right. like, absolutely, absolutely. It doesn't like, it, it doesn't matter what you do, right? And all the stuff you hear in the media, like China bans Bitcoin mining. Okay, cool. There are still Bitcoin miners all over the world. Great. Because and believe me, China bans Bitcoin mining. There's still going to be like 10 miners out there in the hills somewhere hiding. It doesn't matter. As long as you have like a few here or there, the system works. It's like it doesn't, you can keep shutting them down and new ones will pop up. That's the beautiful thing about mining is uh, because we said that you have to sort of have this equilibrium between the price of electricity and the price of mining. The mining always seeks out the cheapest possible electricity at the most remote locations. Otherwise, you will eventually become unprofitable. So all this kind of stuff you hear in the media about Bitcoin will eat the world's energy, like, no, because at some point the energy is going to be more expensive than, than the Bitcoin. So as long as there's competition and there's always competition for this, then the competition drives everybody to the cheapest possible energy source. Uh, uh, in a way, humans can't help it, right? Right. And it, the, the craziest thing is, it's like it, it taps into fundamental economics. It's just greed. Like you want to make money, mine Bitcoin. But you better be good at it because if you're not and if you don't completely run a tight ship, best energy cost, tightest operational, then you're going to eventually become unprofitable. And we've seen this happen. Like we've seen people take massive, you know, build massive companies that just got decimated like Bitmain because they made some bad decisions. And all, all that space is just going to be sucked up by little miners here and there. They're going to go to Iceland. They're going to go to far reaches of you know, uh, Canada. They're going to go to different places where energy is untapped in the hills uh, from some waterfall. And they're going to mine Bitcoin. Um, and that's that's me. <laughs> that that is that is amazing. And uh, um, the like um, ah, I lost my train of thought. But <laughs> sorry, I get kind of like really into that stuff. Um, <laughs> it'll it'll come back to me. Oh, um, it already did. Basically, what we're talking about is um, humans, just like a bee can help but extract nectar from the flower humans can help but mine that. i love that analogy that's great <laughs> yeah it, it, it just is and and we never had something like this before where humans just mesmerized by it and just act like like uh, automatons you know in a way we're going to get to this uh, you know out there subject at the end uh, all right so let's go back into so so we did resolve um, a lot of these problems but we're not done yet are we right so Let's talk about security because I think, so we talked about there's a ledger, it's no longer at a bank, right? In a bank they have security guards and they have uh, software intrusion detection systems. In Bitcoin we said everybody has a ledger, right? Everybody has a copy of it. We said that miners get to sort of compete and play lottery to see who gets the right to that ledger. And then everybody else gets to download a copy of that ledger and, and verify payments for themselves. So if Kastuda sends me some Bitcoins, I run my own uh, verifying machine. It's called a Bitcoin full node. It looks at that transaction, it says, does this transaction actually show that Kasuda sent me real Bitcoins that existed? Like, where did he get them and where did they come from, right? There's actually a chain of history for each Bitcoin transaction that goes all the way back to that Genesis block being the first block of Satoshi Mine in 2009. So we have 10 years of history. You can actually, like, there's people who do uh, forensics on this. You can do, like, data forensics. You can dig into the blockchain and you can see the last 10, uh, sorry, I used the word blockchain. I'm gonna explain that in a second. But the blockchain is that ledger where Bitcoin stores uh, all of its data, right? Um, so a lot of people will say Bitcoin's for criminals and all that kind of stuff. Bitcoin is the most traceable thing there is on the planet. You literally, every Bitcoin you have, you can literally trace its history all the way back to the beginning of time. Like it carries the history of its ownership. Now, are there things you can do to obscure that history? Yes, um, we can get into that if we want to. But uh, the long story short is we have a history. So, sorry to interrupt you. Yeah. The history will be still there. It just would be so confusing that you may it not be able to tell. Who, the history is there, but in the Bitcoin ledger, the name Jan does not appear. The name Kastudis does not appear. We don't use our real identities. That's actually a huge benefit of Bitcoin because 
Uh, we know that identity thefts happen all the time. Uh, a few years ago, we had Equifax got hacked for like 140 million uh, people's worth of uh, personal data. Okay, so right. your numbers, all that kind of stuff. This is a really bad system we've built. Unfortunately, we've built these centralized honeypots of, of personal information. Bitcoin does away with all of that, and instead we have a trail that is based on these anonymous looking addresses that are just like a bunch of numbers and letters. And each address represents a certain amount of Bitcoin that's in there, and that Bitcoin then travels to other uh, addresses, and you can kind of follow that, that, chain, that chain of custody all the way to the very beginning to when it was mined by the very first miners. So, uh, so the thing is, how do we keep that secure, right? Because if this is a database of, of this um, uh, ledger of accounts all the way from 2009 to 2019, how come Castutus doesn't have one where he owns a million dollars and he's just going to send me his ledger and I'm going to be, uh, you know, uh, misled by it and, and accept money that isn't real? So this is this is it gets pretty interesting. So we talked about uh, this mining process. They're playing a lottery, right? What they're actually doing is they're taking all the transactions that, that uh, people have announced that they want to put into that ledger. Okay, so I want to send five Bitcoins to Kasudas, or you want to send them to somebody else. Everybody's announcing these transactions. And miners, they collate all these transactions, they put them in order uh, by time, and they basically uh, hash this thing. Like we said, we, we hash that data to produce that crazy number to, see, to win the lottery. Mm -hmm. And we call that a block. Okay, a block is just a piece of, uh, uh, it's all the transactions plus this hash is kind of a fingerprint of what's inside that block, okay? That's the first block, Satoshi makes the first block and then all it has is one transaction where he's, you know, he got 50 Bitcoins or whatever. Um, the next block also contains some newly generated Bitcoins but it also may contain some of the prior Bitcoins that got generated being moved, okay? I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm glossing over some of the technicalities so hardcore Bitcoin people, please don't, get into this with me. I know how it actually works. <laughs> but basically, you have one block okay, uh, that comes after the next one. So what do we do to ensure that the, trans the, his the history of transactions is valid? Well, every time we get a block, we have to connect it to a prior block. We have to say the transactions in this block are the results of spending stuff that happened in this other prior block. Okay, and This is why we call it a block chain. It's a chain of blocks. Mm -hmm. Okay, So mm -hmm. you hear that whole that word. It's nothing that fancy. It's just a bunch of blocks that have transaction data chained together. Now, right. how are they chained together? This is the key thing. They're chained together by each block referring to the prior block in part of its hash. Okay, remember the hash is that crazy number generated from smushing a bunch of transactions for magical math formula. Right. So the block is not just the transactions, it's the transactions plus the hash of the prior block. Okay, so boom, now they're connected. You love my finger-based diagramming here? Now they're connected, okay? Now, if somebody wants to tamper with this, they're going to go and change the data in here, and they're going to say, okay, because Tudis is he actually has got a million Bitcoins right here. That changes the hash of this block. If that changes the hash of this block, then this block, because it depends on the hash of this block, also changes. Okay, so now every block that's come afterwards has changed, and, and this is called tamper evidence. We can see that somebody's tampered with it. We can see that somebody has gone in and changed it, okay? So... How do we know um, which, so like, well, let's say I connect to the Bitcoin network today, I'm a first time user, I install Bitcoin core software on my computer, I launch it, it connects to a few other Bitcoin computers, and it downloads a full copy of this uh, history all the way back to 2009, right? Now, five of, I connect to eight nodes, uh, meaning other computers, you know, six of them give me one history, and two of them give me another history. Which one am I going to believe? Uh, now, the naive answer is I'm going to believe the ones that's the, the majority, right? But that causes a problem because if it's the case that anybody who connects to the network gets will believe the majority of what they of what they receive, then it's very easy for me to cheat. I'll just go on my AWS, my my Amazon Web Services account. I will spin up a million computers. I will connect to the Bitcoin network, and I will start feeding people a copy of the ledger that says that I have. You know, a million Bitcoin. That's not the right. real ledger. That's not true. That, <laughs> right. So that kind of brings that uh, you know to the fifty-one attack that we're, we're going to talk next. Yeah, we're going to so, talk about yeah. So for 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 people to kind of understand, you know, even if you understand the technological, uh, you know, side of it, like the, the way uh, I look at it is that it's like you building the you know the the block of of like like a Lego block, right? One on top of each other, right? And if you mess 
if you take out the one below it, it just collapsed the whole thing. I mean, that's in essence. I mean, it's not the best metaphor, but yeah. that's what's going on. Like, uh, it, you you can't it's tamper uh, tamper proof because it's not the majority that uh, determines you know which which block is, is blockchain is is true, but uh, the one that has done the most work. Yes, that is correct. So that's what I was going to get into. So. That idea is if I get two different copies of the ledger, both of which look correct, because you know, Kastutis, he could go and create his own copy of the ledger and he could rework every block. Uh, and he could create, let's say there's a thousand blocks in the chain. He could make a new chain of a thousand blocks. And because he's the only miner on that chain, for him it will be very cheap, right? He, he will not have to compete with all the other miners. So he will just produce a new chain of a thousand blocks and he will give me this history and he will say, look, Jan, this is the real history. It's a thousand blocks, just like the other one. How do you know which one is real? Well, Bitcoin resolved this problem in a very interesting way, and it's basically by who has done the most cumulative amount of work. We assume whoever has put in the most amount of energy is the most incentivized to be the correct, to be the true ledger. And the thing is, that, honestly, it doesn't matter if it's true or not, because as long as, well, sorry, what I want to say is we don't know that, um, all we know is that everything in that, chain has played by the rules. There's been no new Bitcoins produced that haven't supposed to be produced. There's been no transactions that people sent that for money they didn't own and so on. All these rules are enforced with every block, right? This is true of any chain that, that follows Bitcoin's rules. But if we have two competing chains, each of which has a different amount of proof of work, now we will decide which one is correct by the most cumulative amount of work. Mm -hmm. This means that if, Kastutis, if the current chain is a thousand blocks long, that's not actually relevant. It's not relevant how many blocks long it is. It's relevant how much total work went into it. And when we talk about total work, we can talk about like maybe dollars expended, if that's an easier way to think about it. Let's say okay. there's a million dollars to produce this one chain and a thousand dollars to produce this other chain. I'm going to believe the one that has a million dollars worth of work on it. Yes, because because that work means the honesty as well. Right. Each because each we, we, if, if it, reinforced, it is reinforcing the honesty of the prior block because it's saying, I believe that this was the longest chain and now I'm mining on top of it. And then the right. one after that says, I believe that these two are the longest chain, or the heaviest chain by proof of work, and I'm going to mine on top of that and keep building. That goes back. Yeah, th that goes back to the honest ledger. That is why right. we're going with the longest chain. Right. Because yeah. that means that it's been kept honest. Yes, it's been kept okay. honest. Yeah. Uh, okay, and so so now um, uh, why don't we go into the scenario? Like, uh, because a lot of people, you know, a lot of uh, uh, Bitcoin skeptics go into this scenario. A, a, in 51 attack it's been talked about this uh, uh, you know um, a lot but i think that you can explain it in a way of like why this is not a real threat uh in in a, in a very easy to understand way and kind of debunk this once and for all sure i'm, I'm definitely going to try so yeah if, if you you know google like problems with bitcoin probably the, the first thing you see is like the 51 percent attack so the 51 percent attack the idea of that is that if you are mining, okay, if you have, so when we mine, we have a concept of hash power. Hash power means like how much computing power, how many mining operations per second are you doing, okay? Now, if you have the majority of that hash power on the network, so let's say, let's say the system is just me and Kastutis, we both are mining, okay? We're both mining competing chains, and we're trying to convince the third party, you the listener, of which of our ledgers is the correct ledger, okay? Since the Bitcoin protocol determines the correct ledger by whoever's done the most amount of work, that means that if you have the majority of the hash power, you will eventually produce a chain that has the most amount of work. Okay, so how can this be used in an attack? Well, let's say that we have our normal Bitcoin history, right? And it's going along, chugging along, producing blocks every 10 minutes. Now, somebody is going to take uh, and build a. They're going to they're going to take half of the hash power of the entire network. So they're, maybe they're going to pay off these miners. Or maybe they will like build their own entire new mining operation that's going to equal the entire total power of the Bitcoin network. And they're going to start mining a separate chain secretly. Okay. And eventually they will make a longer chain because they have more hash power. Okay. Let's say we're spending a million dollars a day securing the normal Bitcoin chain. Again, I don't know if that's the real number. I'm just making that up. Let's say we're spending a million dollars a day securing ours. Let's say they're willing to spend two million dollars a day mining their chain. Okay. At some point, they're going to produce a longer chain than us. Then they can just connect to our network and they can give us their version of the chain. And now everybody must, based on the Bitcoin's code, they will all switch over to this new chain. This is called a reorg, a reorganization of the chain. 
their chain is now the source of truth. That is a 51% attack. It's a way to change the history of the chain. Now, they could go back in time as far as they want, as long as they have the hash power to support that. Mm -hmm. Can I just bring this uh, to a little bit, uh, uh, you know, a little bit down to earth, you yeah. know, because Please. Uh, yeah, it's, just, it's yeah. pretty technical for um, mo probably a lot of listeners. So what Jan is saying is saying is that that uh, it, it, what happens at that point is that we have um, a minority uh, approving what is true, right? And therefore we have a majority who gets to say what is true by producing the longest chain because obviously they have the most you know hashing power now if the if that happens they get to do uh whatever they want with the because you know they get to essentially lie right and it's it's a it's a reasonable thought experiment well, well but, but, but what happens uh, but what really happens as a consequence can yeah i want to caveat with when we say lie what can they do they can produce another valid Bitcoin chain. Okay, so they, what things they cannot do, they cannot produce Bitcoin faster than is allowed by the algorithm because we have the difficulty adjustment. And if they cheat on that, then when we receive their blocks, we will say, these don't have the correct difficulty numbers. We know what the difficulty target is. Every 2016 blocks, we all recalculate it. We know what it is. They can't produce Bitcoin faster than is necessary. They cannot, that means they can't produce new Bitcoins faster, you know, other than by spending that, that energy. Two, they can't spend money that's not theirs. Every Bitcoin transaction is signed. It's like a signature similar to what you put on your check, but it's a digital signature. It's a cryptographic signature. It's based on math and cryptography, and it can't be forged. So basically, unless you have my signature, my private keys to make those signatures, you cannot forge a transaction from me to Castutus. So that means even if you're mining this other chain, you still can't spend money that's not yours. So you can't create new money really faster than, than you should. You can't uh, spend money that's not yours. What can you actually do? There's two things that are basically at the fallout of 51% attack. One, you can mine empty blocks. If you mine empty blocks, you're basically making the Bitcoin system unusable because if you, if you have the majority of the hash power, that means you can continue building this chain. You can keep mining empty blocks and not allow anybody's transactions to enter the ledger. Totally fine. If you want to do that, it's going to cost a lot of money, but you can do that. The second thing that you can do is called a double spend. This is where... Let's say you send money to an exchange, you cash it out for US dollars, and later but you wait for a few days, and then you produce a new chain where that transaction never happened, where you never sent that money to the exchange. So now that new chain becomes the reality. The exchange has basically just lost their Bitcoin because the exchange will no, the exchange will no longer be shown as owning that Bitcoin. But you will already have the dollars or whatever physical cash you have. So you will have sort of made off with that money. Now that's called double spend. It basically is an attack on the exchange or whoever it is you're trying to double spend against. It's not really an attack against Bitcoin as a whole because it doesn't do anything to the overall system. Um, so, so that you can do that, but but, but that it, it, a lot of money. Okay, so uh, the reality is this: is that if you do want to, you know, have fifty-one attack, you would need to spend a lot, a lot of money. To have the most hashing power, right? Is that yeah, correct? Like, just to put it in perspective, we there's lots of estimates out there, but basically it's in the range of like what what some kind of like small country puts out as their total energy output. So not only are you going to have to spend that entire energy output, you're also going to have to figure out how to acquire all the Bitcoin mining machines, which are specialty manufactured, which only a few companies manufacture currently. We're so talking have, billions. Like, we're talking billions. We're talking bill. Yeah, billions. Yeah, and yeah, we're right. talking about that. I mean. I don't know what the current there's there's websites to calculate it. I think it's like a few million per hour or something like that. But even if you were able to like launch this attack, let's say you were able to harness the energy of a country. Let's say you were able to get all of those ASIC computers uh, purchased somewhere or built or whatever, right? Like we don't know. Maybe the the government is shadow building like giant facilities for ASICs. Let's say all of that was possible. What are the worst things they do? They either make the chain unusable for a bit because they're mining empty blocks, or they double spend again. If, if double spends are noticed, then all that's going to mean is that normally people wait for a certain number of blocks to be produced to, con to consider Bitcoin uh, a Bitcoin transaction as, as valid. Not valid, but like spent. Because essentially, since, since this kind of stuff can happen, uh, we want to wait a little bit and make sure that our, our transactions are buried under more and more and more work. Because remember, to redo a transaction that's this deep, you have to not only redo that block, you have to redo every block after it. Okay, so the further back in history you want to try to attack, you have to spend like all of that energy that was already spent mining that chain. 
and you have to be faster than the current chain. So you you got to go twice as fast, kind of. I, I think there's some. That's probably not the right exact number, but conceptually, you have to go not just as fast as the current chain, but twice as fast if you want to go back, fix that stuff, and the current stuff that's that's being mined forward. So it, we're talking about inordinate amounts of energy and money. Okay, so we're talking about a huge scale, um, you know, attempt to, to do that, and um, the most that they can do is double spend which means they can scam you know some people out of out, out of money is, is that correct uh, yeah, assumption basically like the, the sort of the most classic way to do that is an exchange you scam an exchange okay because which you exchange it for something that you can make off with like and run away with them to a caribbean island where nobody can find you right so so which i mean it's possible to do but which can could be find out very quickly right is that correct? yeah and right and okay the, you know, that, that, then goes into classic law enforcement like you know right, right. pull our stuff go find them yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so even if somebody did that, uh, the, the after spending billions of dollars, they can spend uh, uh, scam somebody, you know, for perhaps you know only millions, right? Uh, uh, and then as a consequence, that will be find out. In, in, Most likely, yeah, right. Okay. Uh, so I mean, there have been small like this kind of attack has happened on all kinds of other coins, like uh, Ethereum Classic had it, Bitcoin Gold had it, like uh, uh, Verge I think had this. They, they all have this um, chains that use less computing power to secure them. This is why Bitcoin is, is what it is, because it has the by far the biggest amount of hash power in the world. The more hashing power, the more secure it is. The more yes. secure it is, because in order to attack it, you need a, this imme immense resources. And you need the special computers, too, which is like a nice little cherry on top of Bitcoin. They have these ASICs that have been special produced. And everybody who owns an ASIC has invested like millions of dollars into these ASIC farms. If they attack Bitcoin, they invalidate their hardware because, in the, you know, in the worst so, case, we will change the proof of work algorithm and make their hardware worthless. So what you're saying is that they get a cash go and then they have to murder their cash go. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, so that's why it's not incentivized to for 51% attack. It's right. Perfect. I mean, I think the, the most likely 51% attack would come from somebody who's not trying to make money. Like, let's say uh, a government that really wants to mess with the system. But again, like, let's say that they were able to have this infinite money printing machine and like just keep keep spending money and make the chain unusable. Let's say they don't mine empty blocks. I mean, if it's unusable for a day, a two, a week or something, like I could see the community getting behind a, a proof of work change and basically uh, everybody was, will trust a new algorithm. And if they select a new algorithm, that whole attack is thwarted. So even the idea that the attack could be thwarted, I think keeps the attack from happening because it's basically just a losing venture. Like you might as well just spend that money mining Bitcoin. So it's like an insurance against it, right? It's like, it's like yeah, you, you do it, but uh, we'll find a way around it. Right. right. And it, it's it's like, you know, I don't, I don't want to equate this because I don't think it's like, but it's almost like, you know, the Pirate Bay when they came out, um, you know, uh, you know, obviously they said like, all we did is just, you know, connected people together. We, cre we created a peer-to-peer -peer platform. That's all we did, you know, that's not our fault. Um, so what happens is that uh, obviously they went after them and, you know, everybody knows this, the story, but guess what? The pirate base is still running. It keeps popping up, right? I mean, and Bitcoin is uh, arguably much more resilient than, than even those things because not only like there's money involved, so there's, there's crazy amounts of incentives. There's all jurisdictions all over the world is completely distributed. The Pirate Bay, like it jumps around, but it's still kind of centralized, right? So they mm -hmm. kill it in one spot, it goes somewhere else. Um, with Bitcoin, it's it's like a hydra. There's all these heads, right? There's like hundreds of thousands of nodes all over the world. You want to shut one down, another one will pop up over here. Like there's just no way around it. So um, I think the best option is for governments to embrace it and then figure out how to how to live with it. And I think yes. for the most part, the U.S. is actually going to do the right thing. Right? I'm hoping. Yeah, I think if 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 a if they really think this through, and I think they do, you know, some people do, uh, they will kind of realize what is the consequences is that you 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 have to go behind this technology, uh, and you know find the, the way to live with it as opposed to trying to fight it. Uh, although, you know, there might be some financial incentive in trying to fight it, uh, but perhaps capitalizing on them on on it themselves. You know, like if, if I, you know, like I said, a bit of off the tangent, but if I were to be a central banker, um, and I would understand that you know the house of cards that i built is about to collapse i would look for the you know lifeboat and bitcoin might be it could be could be yeah and i mean there's a lot of good um andreas talks where he kind of talks about how how this happens because you know one of the things he talks about is like 
you know, the government is just a bunch of people, right? And and the more corrupt your government is, the more uh, uh, the more the wheels of that government are greased with bribes already. And so, what do you think starts happening in a government where you know the currency is devalued? People are starting to take bribes in Bitcoin, and all of a sudden, all your officials are now like Bitcoiners, right? So like they're not going to want to kill it. So you, it's like a self fulfilling prophecy where it's very very difficult to do anything about it. If you if you make noise about it, it becomes more popular. And the more noise you make about it, the more you're showing people that they need it, right? Like mm -hmm. if your government's like, we must shut down Bitcoin, then everybody's like, oh shit, Bitcoin's a thing, we should buy some, yeah. right? <laughs> we have an authoritarian government that wants to, to tell us how we are going to live our lives. We better buy some kind of lifeboat. Uh, and I think that's what we're seeing all over the world. There's been some great articles that show, uh, you know, the spikes in demand in Venezuela and all of the different surrounding countries as they watch what happens to Venezuela the local bitcoins volume is going you know going through the roof because everybody's seeing that and they're like we, we don't want to be next they yeah. know that even if their government's okay for now this is just like it's just a waiting game like what's yeah. the next one uh, i mean i mean a lot of people are still asleep but a lot of people are waking up that um the debt system right. yeah. is about to end and the new saving system is a, is, is is being born right now and yeah you know, i mean i think the word about to is probably debatable like we don't know my own theory is that this is going to take a generation. I, I really you know, have a very long view of Bitcoin. I think it's going to be something for my kids, maybe my grandkids. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's require it's going to require people to grow up with this as normal, just like we saw. We didn't see Facebook until Zuck grew up, right? We didn't. Facebook wasn't made by some sixty-year-old dude. It took somebody born into the internet to understand social media, and it's going to take, uh, you know, despite whatever we think about Facebook, it still was a pretty big innovation. Uh, these things happen from people who are born native to this. Like, not even you and I, you know, we, we're doing our best to bridge that gap Absolutely. with our kids. The kids that are being born right now, which is like, um, if we look at the generation biologically, they say by, you know, a generation is 20 years. So um, I think it's safe to say 20 years from now, uh, we may see something where Bitcoin is, 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 is you know, uh, completely adopted. Would you, yeah. would you say that? I think that's it's definitely a possibility. Like what I I've talked about this before, but I think a lot of people point to Venezuela and they're like, uh, if there's one camp that's like Bitcoin's going to save Venezuela, and there's another camp that says Venezuelans don't have money to buy Bitcoin. Like they don't give a shit about Bitcoin. They have like five dollars a month to live on. So and both I think both are wrong. I think that yes, Venezuela is not going to be saved by Bitcoin. It's just way too late. They already have a fucked up government. It's already collapsing. Like you're not going to fix that revolution by injecting Bitcoin from the sky. But okay, I think yeah, yeah. Uh, we're getting into the politics now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll finish it off with the with the politics. It's very you know fascinating subject. But um, uh, we ha we still have one more problem uh, to talk about, uh, which uh, Bitcoin address. But you know, so far, I would like to people to just kind of grasp the idea of what just happened you know like the, the whole story that um you know yan ex explained to you what satoshi invented and contrast that with new inventing inventions contrast that with new inventions like you know these altcoins and whatever they think that they could do better than that right so in if they are claiming to do better than that then go ahead investigate what uh, the problem they have resolved that bitcoin hadn't already Okay, and, and and if you do that, then you'll be able to compare the you know the value of Bitcoin and the value of these all all coins. You know, and you know the way I see the the only coins that do have value is the clones of Bitcoin. You know, and they're just like what the, what Tom Bezos is saying is that's 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 that natural. value may, may very well be temporary. Yeah, one. I mean, the thing is, um, I think a lot of Altcoins compete on the wrong axis with Bitcoin. I think they misunderstand what Bitcoin is about. Um, because if you look at the marketing materials for most altcoins, it's either we're cheaper, we're faster, um, we have introduced feature XYZ. Um, the thing is that Bitcoin's core uh, value proposition is immutability and decentralization. Okay, it is very, very difficult to change. This is a requirement for having a new kind of monetary system. Um, the fact that Satoshi is somebody we don't is is has disappeared. We don't know who that person is. Is a huge part of Bitcoin's uh, advantage, actually, and and something that's very difficult to to have again. Okay, because Bitcoin was born quietly. Nobody cared about it. It was able to to flourish in this environment where nobody tried to kill it. Nobody tried to try to stop it. 
it didn't have any value. Nobody gave a shit. And it and slowly grew, and it slowly grew an immune system, and it was slowly able to acquire these properties. Any new coin that's trying to launch and say, we're going to compete with Bitcoin, what they're trying to say is, we're going to be cheaper and faster. Okay, great. How do you get cheaper and faster than Bitcoin? Well, it's very easy. You get more centralized because by definition, the cheapest and fastest thing that you will ever have is like one computer. Okay, you have everything on one computer, very, very cheap, very, very fast. I promise you, okay? It doesn't cost anything. Now you have two computers, now you have to, they have to communicate, okay? You have a thousand computers, they have to communicate. You have 10,000, 100,000. The more computers you have on a network, the costlier the communication between them becomes. So decentralization has a cost to it. If we're really going to have everybody in the world store and transmit the Bitcoin ledger to each other all the time, that has a huge cost to it. And if we want to say that this system will continue to grow in decentralization, that means that the, the storage and bandwidth and everything like that has to uh, not outpace the, the number of nodes and the no amount of decentralization that it has. And that's only just one axis. I mean, we're talking about the developers. There's all these, you know, if you look at Trace Mayer's um, uh, network effects of Bitcoin, he does a much better job than I will of summarizing this, but there's layers upon layers of network effects here. And so when we see altcoins that are competing on speed or whatever, that's great. But how are they competing on speed? First of all, they have a dev team that is, has a leader. They usually have a CEO. They usually have a for-profit motive. These are centralizing things. You can't move fast without centralizing. If you're moving fast, you're centralized. If you're centralized, you can be stopped. Not great. Uh, secondly, you're misunderstanding the entire value proposition. You're building a system that's going to be geared towards centralization. And look, I, I am not ready to say that there's absolutely zero other case, use cases for blockchain. I know I'm going to get a lot of shit from maximalists for this. There might be a thing where like 10 computers get together and run a gaming network. There's nothing wrong with that, but it doesn't have to be money, okay? It doesn't have to be something you invest in. That's like a distributed system. We have them all the time. They are, they're great and, and, and they have a use case. Okay, so building distributed systems, there's a use case for that. Building competitors to Bitcoin, it's very, very difficult. You, you're competing with crazy decentralization and crazy network effects. Um, yes, and, uh, and more decentralized uh, and, Bitcoin and get there faster than Bitcoin. That's like uh, that. Those two things are directly opposing forces. And all, only thing that you really can do is build on top of Bitcoin. So, so why don't you just you know work on Bitcoin improvement proposal, right? Like right. you know th th that's the only way to to, to, to do it. Like, I, I really do believe there's a lot of well-meaning people in the space, and as an engineer, I could see the lure of it. Like when I read the theory of marketing, as I was telling you, I think it's very powerful. And if you're an engineer and you've ever built like a financial system and you see what Ethereum can do in a hundred lines of code, it's very, very cool. Like it's amazing. You can build a coin, you can build a bank, whatever. Um, but then you realize that like when you've built this thing, A, it has a bunch of security problems. B, it may not actually be decentralized because you don't really know how decentralized Ethereum is. There's all these other like sort of side issues. Then, and, and C, like, <laughs> it's not money, right? Whatever you're building, it's not money. So, so don't right. try to build money. As long as you're not trying to build money, you're not asking people for money to do this thing. Like, you know, go with God, do your thing. Like, why can't engineers innovate? They, they should innovate. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, competing on the money front, this is what it took me a long time to understand because I am a technologist, okay? It took me a lot of study of like economics and, and the Bitcoiner thought around like Austrian economics and all this kind of stuff to understand why Bitcoin has the best chance of becoming a money and why nothing else does. Um, and why there will be only one money, most likely. I mean, there, there could be a long tail of, of coins that are used for some random purpose. But look, we have one chance to like change the world to a better place. It's not gonna be done with a thousand coins. You need one no. flagship that, that is the money. Okay, that's why you have the US dollar. Frankly, that's, that's the flagship today. Okay, everybody uses the dollar even in other countries. It's, it, we denominate oil in dollars. That's the flagship currency of our world. But, but will it be forever? I don't think so. <laughs> ah, this is very interesting that you said it. Like a few points I want to say. Like first, like um, you said, dollar is the flagship, and uh, maybe it's not a coincidence why dollar is the flagship because that might be the like what we talked about before, a semi-decentralized system, right? Uh, that actually, that's actually a good point. I don't know. I've never thought about it that way, but I think that that could be. It's it could be why our our, our country is strong and why we've had right. the innovation yeah. we've had and so on. But a lot of why the dollar is a flagship is like it's like freak accidents of history, like what happened during World War II and all that stuff. That's really why we we are the world currency. I mean, had it gone another way, had the Germans won, like 
something else would be infinite. So uh, uh, the way I see this is we had evolution of the currencies that when we had one currency that is kind of, you know, backed up with the uh, protected capitalism in a way, in a semi-decentralized way. And that's what was dollar, and that's what we have. But that kind of comes to the end. And the next thing that that we have right now is, you know, a fully decentralized system. It's like a step in evolution. And it's kind of very easy to envision that that will probably, like, I mean, when you look at, the, you know, these, you know, these famous, uh, you know, sketches of the um, um, man evolution from, from you know, the, the, the primitive, uh, you know, uh, types of apes like um, uh, these, you know, Homo erectus and, and so and, and so on. You get to see the evolution, so you can kind of see where it's going to head it. So it's almost in the same way that it gives Bitcoin more credibility because you we've seen this with the dollar and what dollar properties were and why it became so widely used. You know, as you, as you mentioned, as a flagship. So if that is true, then it's very easy to see how Bitcoin, you know, will be a next flagship. Yeah, I think that's an interesting use case uh, or uh, an interesting point that you've made. And also, if we consider that you know the decentralization of our of our government has allowed more free market activity than most other countries, it's also like given rise to a lot of industries. And there are certain industries that the U.S. dollar can't serve, like you can't buy you know drugs, like this prostitution to a certain extent. Like you know, like uh, Visa won't serve those types of businesses, right? So. It's interesting to say that like uh, the U.S. dollar serves this market, but Bitcoin also serves the other unserved markets. Even though we may think they're morally gray or whatever, like people should be free to do whatever they want, right? So if you want to buy, like you know, a great example is uh, Peter McCormack with the um, on the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Like he talked about his mom having cancer, he couldn't buy drugs for her in in the U.K. Mm. because it was illegal. Yeah. Like yeah. what the fuck? I mean, <laughs> buy what you want, man. I mean, like that's that's the thing. Like this currency gives us the ability to eliminate black markets and that potentially reduces gang violence. It makes people better off. It lets people feel free. Like these are things that, that we need. So potentially the addressable market of the, of Bitcoin could be bigger than the US dollar because it serves all existing US dollar markets plus some that the US dollar won't serve. Yes, I absolutely agree. I, I think that, uh, you know, the co uh, currency control only breeds the black markets and uh, um, the, the nobody, it doesn't serve anyone. It just hurts people, it, 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 you know, and it doesn't even serve, serve anyone. I mean, any, you know, uh, uh, reasoning you may propose of why controlling the currency is, you know, a good idea, the history shows us that it is not a good idea, that we will have the black markets, we will have people um, that are pretty much, uh, uh, you know, can can have their, their, their um, uh, family... Uh, you know, members dying because of the currency control issue, uh, you know, and, and, and kind of these types of consequences were in, when in reality, when you look at it, you, you can kind of clearly see that, you know, even with the drug use, you know, this is like, oh, people buying drugs and like, okay, well, what's wrong with that? If, you know, let's look at the, what a lot of uh, countries are doing and um, they're legalizing drugs and they're saying, okay, well, people are going to use it anyway. So let's eliminate the black market because everybody's dying over there. Right. So l l let's just create something like a clinic and people can come in and use drugs as much as they want, you know, right. whether they pay for it or not. I mean, the thing yeah. is that, that that's the problem. What A lot of our policies stem from like moral positions that are a lot of times grounded in religion or other wacky things that are like, there's no real reason why we can't let people be people and do their own thing, right? This no. is... This is absurd, and uh, I think my my uh, the optimist in me says that we're headed towards the right direction. We see there's movements for legalization here. We see people start to relax their moral stances. But the thing is that this is this is us here. I mean, there's also other countries with like strict Islamic, you know, Sharia law and like stuff like that, where they're very very strict about this stuff. And honestly, the best thing we can do is give people a currency so that they can do something with that currency that the government doesn't want them to do. And that will yeah. give power over time. That will chip away at that power structure and will allow people to do what they need to live their lives without somebody who thinks they know better, you know, meddling. Absolutely. And I sound like a crazy libertarian, which is strange because I'm really not. I'm not that. I'm not that far out on the libertarian scale. To me, these things are like obvious, right? If you like yeah. grow up in the Soviet Union, it's obvious that you don't want centralized power. But the yeah. thing, even in America, even though we're relatively decentralized, it's still all like. Uh, Republicans are going to fix it or Democrats are going to fix it. Like, no, when you have somebody in charge with that massive amount of money under their fingers, they're going to abuse it. 
it doesn't matter if you think you're politically aligned with what they believe today because they're going to abuse it and one day you're not going to like it yeah i think whether you're a libertarian or republican or democrat it doesn't really matter as long as you're human you would agree with this you would think <laughs> there are humans who don't uh, agree with this. <laughs> uh, no, no I, I don't think they get it that's what it is i think yeah. if they were get it if they say they say like, do you think this is bad or you know this is good or bad and, and if we really dig into this i think these people would realize that um now that i do understand that you know what like i i don't see the other way i mean you know, i have to agree with it that's because i don't think I that, is, with this, you know i hope that that's where we're going as a world as as the world but um it will take some time to get there well it's it's like those people that are not going to subscribe to something that is the truth you know um including governments well um you know if 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 the power is something that they want they better be you know uh, uh, buying a lot of bitcoin and that's right that's, that's what i what i have to say you know about that and because you will be irrelevant a uh, line on the map if you are not going to adopt bitcoin that's mm -hmm. that's pretty much how what i have to say about that yeah all right, uh, so let's go into the next one because there's a lot of um, uh, sort of arguments and um, skeptics, Bitcoin skeptics. And what they say is they say, well, well, who does control Bitcoin, right? If nobody controls Bitcoin, how can it improve if nobody controls Bitcoin? So how do we resolve that problem? Yeah, that's a really good question and also a pretty comp complex one to answer. Um, so I'll try to get, get high level with it. Uh, the way that I think about Bitcoin is almost like a, a three branches of government system. And I don't want to take credit for this idea because I'm pretty sure I read it somewhere, but I like it. It's a really good concept. Uh, there are miners, right? There are the people who get to write to the ledger. There are developers. There are the people who make code and there are users there, which are generally businesses, people receiving payments, things like that. Right. Or even people just like storing some of their wealth in Bitcoin. So these three entities basically keep each other in check. Okay. And here, here's how that works. So let's say, we want to change something about Bitcoin, and currently there's there's some changes on the table. Uh, actually, let's go back. Let's go back to last year and talk a little bit about Segwit 2x. <clears throat> there was a there was a proposal to change something about Bitcoin, which was sorry. And, uh, so yeah. before you get in, you know, people who don't understand how Bitcoin is improving is through such thing as Bitcoin improvement proposals, as so called BIPs, and Jan is, is about to explain one of those. Yeah, that's definitely okay. So. Let's start with what Bitcoin is, is a piece of software, okay? A piece of software that is open source. This is important if you're, if you're new to Bitcoin um, or the concept of open source. We can read the code of how Bitcoin works. So nobody has to trust anybody in terms of like, when Satoshi posted about Bitcoin, he didn't just say, hey, everybody, I invented Bitcoin. Here's this thing, run it on your computer. What he said is, I've invented Bitcoin. Here's the source code so you can see exactly how it works. You can make it run on your computer by yourself. Mm -hmm. This is really, really a big deal. This is like how Linux works, and Linux is the thing that powers your Android phone. Um, the open it's source, open source. So the yeah. Bitcoin code is open source. Open source. Open source means anybody can look at it. Mm -hmm. It also means anybody can modify it. They can modify their own local version of it. Okay. All right. So let's say right. I want to make some change to Bitcoin. I can go into my source code of Bitcoin and I can make that change. That's totally up to me. Now, Bitcoin though it's a consensus-based system. Okay. So if I make a change. And that changes in my software. I'm going to, every time I mine a block, instead of giving myself 12 and a half Bitcoin, I'm going to give myself a million Bitcoin. Okay, I can I can easily make that change today. I can go into my Bitcoin source code and make that change. And I can start mining. I will mine a block, and inside of the block, I will grant myself a million Bitcoin. Okay, because I've changed my my software. The rest of the network, everybody who's running the other versions of the software, they will reject my block because it does not follow the rules in their source code. Okay, so. Everybody can change their own Bitcoin software, but if you want to make a change that changes the rules of consensus, meaning what, what people believe is correct about Bitcoin, you have to convince everybody else on the network to, to run that new software, okay? So as a developer, I can do whatever I want, but I need the users on the network and the miners on the network to run my software. Otherwise, that software is worthless, okay? So this creates a very interesting sort of like what is it called the mexican standoff when there's like three people pointing guns at each other right so if as a developer i go and, and there is a system there is um some people will say bitcoin is centralized because there is a thing called bitcoin core which is a piece of software uh, hosted on github which is a, a place for developers to collaborate and there are people who have rights to to commit code there 
and other people who don't have rights to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but so there's a process for getting code in there. First of all, there's a process for getting code in there. Second of all, I don't have to run Bitcoin Core. I can run something entirely different than people do. Who, who decides um, um, you know, what code goes in there? And uh, how do we know they are making best decision for Bitcoin? So Bitcoin has, a, has an improvement process. It's called BIP, BIP uh, Bitcoin Improvement Proposal Process. Uh, I'm not going to be like the ultimate authority on it because I haven't actually been through it. I, I've, I've read their stuff. Uh, but basically, it, the general idea is you propose something on the mailing list, you talk it through with other people, and you say, I've been thinking about this. Does anybody see any major problems with this? And you get like this idea of rough consensus. You just see if like other people are into it. And if you just hear like, no, no, this is a terrible idea, then it's a terrible idea, okay? But let's say that it seems like most people are into it. Okay, you might discuss it on the mailing list, you might discuss it on Twitter, you might discuss it on Reddit, you might like discuss it on Slack channels. You are just trying to get buy-in from other people. And generally, this is other developers, okay? To be fair, things proposed by developers, they tend to be very technical and they tend to be things that other developers are best um, suited to evaluate. They're not like things that normal non-coders can really, uh, or non-cryptographers even, can, can really chime in on too much. But if it's, a, uh, if it's a conceptual thing, like last year they tried to implement a thing called uh, to double the Bitcoin block size, which is something conceptually that everybody can understand. It was to double the capacity of how many transactions we can get into a block. On the surface, it seems like a really simple idea. Like everybody was was like understood what that meant, right? Okay. Um, so he here's the thing um, that the important thing I think to to stress is that all of these people are um, less corruptible, if I may say. Um, because they have been invested in Bitcoin for a long time and they cannot be uh, um, financially persuaded. Is, is that correct say, uh, way to say? Yeah, it? Just, I mean, we don't know that they can't be financially persuaded. With enough money, you can well, persuade anybody. But, but yeah, yeah, I mean, a lot of these people are like ideological, like Bitcoiners from the beginning, people who have worked on the code for a long time. They work for Bitcoin related companies, like, or they're independent. Bitcoin ideology and mission versus financial gain. And um, yeah. I think most of them, most of these developers, you know, if, if, if you have developed Bitcoin from the beginning right. or at what point do you, you, you joined it, uh, you may have a situation where, um, you know, not in all cases, but I think what in most cases where you are no longer financially incentivized, but I ideology, Bitcoin ideology incentivized. Yeah, I mean, just like judging conversations I've seen from other people, I generally agree that they seem to be more ideological than, than finance motivated. But the point is it doesn't even really matter, right? Because the code is open source. So let, like, let's say somebody wants to do something malicious. First of all, it has to pass the muster of every other developer, right? Because as they put that code out there for review, somebody's going to come in there and say, hey, like you did something bad here. This is going to break Bitcoin in this way or that way, right? There you go. So you just mentioned the person who is, uh, you know, ideology motivated. In, I mean, everything rests, you know, in this case because we're talking about humans, we're talking about trust, yeah. um, you know. And uh, why all of these people cannot be corrupted? Because you cannot, or, or or should I say, it's very difficult to buy all of them. Yeah, because they are not financially incentivized. Them, but like. Yeah, buying all of them all over the world. But again, it doesn't even matter. Let's say all, let's say worst case scenario, every core developer, and there are hundreds, let's just say that hundreds of people all over the world, some of which are completely anonymous, are somehow compromised by some shadow entity, right? And they start producing bad code. Well, then there's another check and balance there, right? Because the code is open source, right? So that means that everybody else who's running these nodes, and this includes many developers, such as myself, I have never contributed code to Bitcoin Core, but I have reviewed other people's code, and I can read code. And if I see stuff that looks fishy, I'm going to call it out. And I'm going to go on Twitter. I'm going to say, these guys are pushing some crazy shit. Let's not run any of this, okay? So but what motivated you? It wasn't the, the money, right? Oh, what, what motivated, motivated me personally is I want to see Bitcoin succeed. So, so I'm, I'm doing this so, for ideological reasons, right? It's something deep, deep in your soul that just comes out and you can't help right. it. And, and, <laughs> and that's what keeps the, the consensus together. Yes, exactly. That's why you cannot buy it. That's why all these people have this common mission that it just speaks to their souls. That's why. Right. That's why it's the the the, the progression of Bitcoin is unbreakable. And and if if we will have some sort of improvement, it will be towards the Bitcoin ideology and not any kind of other reason. Yeah, and I think there's some very core ideas in Bitcoin that just have consensus around them, like the idea that there's a hard cap of 21 million Bitcoin. I don't see it ever being the case that somebody's going to like push a code update that says 
Uh, this one just doubles it to 42 million in joy, and then people are going to run that. Nobody's going to run that code, right? So it's not about the developers. The developers are producing code that they believe is beneficial to Bitcoin. And most of the reasons is there should be financial incentives, right? Like the people working for Blockstream, they're trying to develop something for their own purposes, and they can have certain financial incentives that may or may not be aligned with other companies that are that are trying to work on Bitcoin because everybody's pushing it in different directions. But by and large, everybody pushing it in different directions creates a certain movement in a direction that's actually what we call Bitcoin, right? Yes, yes. Uh, and again, yes, yes. just because they wrote that code doesn't mean that we're going to run it. The users, the people who hold the money, who receive the payments, those are the people ultimately that have the say because I run my node. If I run, uh, if if they push a change I don't like, I'm not going to run it. I'm going to run the old the old code, or I'm going to run somebody else's code, or I'm going to change it myself, right? Uh, and try to get and, around that. And we did have these disagreements already. Bitcoin has yeah. has been tested, uh, uh, and um, we kind of went through and we saw the consequences. So it's probably uh, unlikely to happen again. I think it's unlikely. I mean, so to let's just summarize what happened. Uh, I think this was in late 2017. Um, yeah, but a little bit more than a year ago, uh, there was a proposal called Segwit2x, and the idea was we're going to double. Uh, so there was kind of two competing ways to scale Bitcoin. One of them is called Segwit. We're not going to get into the, the uh, technicals of it too much, but the idea is that particular upgrade would uh, would be something that was backwards compatible, which means that if you didn't want to upgrade your software, that would be fine. You would still get the benefit of this upgrade. The other upgrade was called. Uh, was was about doubling the block size, okay? Which is something way simpler conceptually. Okay, most people cannot understand what SegWit is. I don't know if I can explain it very well. Okay, it's it's a change in how the blocks are structured, basically. A doubling of the block size, very conceptually easy to understand. We're going to increase the amount of uh, space in the block. That's going to make more transactions. It's going to make more space for transactions that should lower fees. Blah blah blah. So, so the blocks would be bigger, right? So in, instead of instead of writing, you know, the 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 sections of transactions, we're just gonna have one big one. Yeah, instead of like a thousand transactions, we can now put two thousand transactions in. Okay, mm -hmm. that's basically mm -hmm. what it was. So, however, that kind of upgrade, it's called a hard fork. That kind of upgrade would require absolutely everybody to upgrade, and if everybody didn't upgrade, then it would create two coins, and some people would be uh, having the old coin, and some people would have the, old, the new coin. And this and is it did, fun. and it did create two coins. Huh? It, it, and it, it did, it did create it, two well, coins. Uh, to be fair, not Segwit two X, but <laughs> it was it was a separate fork that happened right before Segwit two X, called which is today called Bitcoin Cash, and that's exactly what <clears throat> the Bitcoin Cash people did. They decided to make a new coin with bigger uh, with bigger. What what was it called? That fork? It was called something. You know, I can't remember. Was it a, a not? Wasn't it ABC or yeah, something? ABC is one of the clients. I mean, there's a couple. Yeah clients that supported like Bitcoin ABC and Bitcoin Unlimited and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But it's not, I don't want to get too much into that. Yeah, not, not important. Not the issue. Basically, the idea was a bunch of companies actually like supposedly like 95% of, of the Bitcoin hash rate got into, meaning all of the major mining pools got together and like a huge portion of all the businesses like the Coinbase's and the BitGo's and the Pit, BitPay's. I don't want to muddy anybody's name. I don't remember who was there exactly. Pretty sure BitPay was there. They all got into a room in New York, and they made an agreement. It was called the New York Agreement, and they basically said, let's put an end to this war of SegWit versus big blocks, whatever. We're, we're going to do both. We're going to activate SegWit, which is going to uh, make some people happy, and then later on, we're going to also make the blocks bigger. Okay. This, is, this was supposedly an agreement that they all signed, okay? But when it came to it, uh, a bunch of other stuff happened that basically made that upgrade First of all, miners dropped out. They started seeing that this was going to be an economically a bad idea. And part of the reason was they started having a futures market that was showing the prediction of the price of the new coin. And the new coin was like 15% to 85% of the original, something like that. So a lot of stuff started to happen. And there was code release to start. Like somebody said, we're not going to follow this new coin. We're going to release coin uh, code to, to force everybody to upgrade to SegWit. We're going to forget about it. So long story short, there was a big war. And it created two coins, okay? Just like everybody said, because by definition, increasing the block size creates two coins, okay? You can't get around that. It creates a new sort of coin. And so this is the thing that I think the general uh, public doesn't uh, understand. Uh, so, sorry for, 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 the, you know, for, for people listening. Um, it creates a separate coin uh, that is essentially a clone with a different uh, uh, upgrade. Right, and which is not accepted. The important thing is that new coin is not accepted by the old nodes. Okay. Yeah. That's why we say it, this is called a hard fork. If there's a hard fork, either everybody goes 
or we have two coins. If everybody, yeah. if everybody had upgraded to like the two megabyte blocks, there would be no problem. That would be the new Bitcoin. But if, as long as there's like some stragglers, now we have two coins. We have the old Bitcoin and we have the two megabyte Bitcoin. Yeah. That's what, happened. Um, exactly what happened. We have the Bitcoin Cash, and now if you send Bitcoin Cash to a Bitcoin address, it's not it's not going to be received. It's not a valid transaction. Right. So for somebody asking the question, you know, how do we resolve the problem of the, you know, uh, consensus and the the progression of the development? Is we do it through the evolution and uh, uh, people that are invested in the Bitcoin ideology. And the Bitcoin ideology, uh, I, I don't even think that is, 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 you know, like it's what Bitcoin stands for. And and, and is that um, if you really boil it down to it, is that uh, improving the morals of humans. I mean, I mean, uh, we're gonna get into to, uh, to to that later on. But like every developer uh, that understands it, you can recognize that person right away, right? Like they have some oh, completely yeah. different understanding. For sure, and, yeah. But again, yeah. I think see, I think you're making the argument that like a lot of the devs they have this sort of like ideological base that's very very hard to shake, and I totally agree with that. But just like like uh, the, our our government, right? Where we have the three branches. Not only do we uh, try to elect people that we think are honest and we try our best, but sometimes we get shitty people in power and we get that all the time <laughs> in this country. Um, what keeps our country functional even with shitty people is that decentralized checks and balances system, right? The president can't do something crazy without a check from Congress and the judiciary and vice versa, right? Everybody gets to check everybody else. And the same thing happens with, with Bitcoin. The users check the developers. They don't run their code if they don't like it. Same thing with the miners. They're not going to mine a chain. And, and the thing is, like, if users think that the developer, the miners start running, let's say the miners forked and all the miners decided to do this, like, uh, Bitcoin Cash thing, well, the users are the economic power. They started market selling that Bitcoin Cash. It went down a lot, okay? And, and so what are they saying? They're signaling to the miners, we don't want this coin. Yeah. If we don't want this coin, it's not profitable for you to mine. The miners are like, oh, it's not profitable to mine. We have to come back to Bitcoin. Okay, so the users, at the end of the day, they get to... They are the economic force that says where the miners are going to mine. The miners are going to mine where the users are. The developers are going to de develop the code that the users want. But it all kind of ties together and, and makes an ecosystem that's very hard to um, to corrupt in any direction, regardless of who the people are that are involved. Because you can make an infinite number of, of your own versions, like nobody prevents you from doing that. But the ones that are going to survive is, is probably going to be the ones that uh, uh, solve this problem in the best way. Right, right. And we have to remember that anytime when we have, so this idea of like um, forking Bitcoin has been around for a long time. You can fork the code, which is like Litecoin. Litecoin took Bitcoin's code, but they started a brand new uh, database. They started a brand new chain. So in the Litecoin database, there were like Satoshi didn't own any coins. There was, it's just completely new. Now the idea of like Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Gold and this whole Bitcoin Diamond and God knows what else, Bitcoin Rhodium, like they, they started forking not only Bitcoin's code, but also Bitcoin's database. So what that means is they gave everybody who already owned Bitcoin the same amount of this new coin. Now, that's like a economically a very strange thing to do because that gives every Bitcoin whale new coins at a zero price, right? Like, let's say you owned, like, if you're Roger Ver and you own, you know, thousands of Bitcoins, I don't know how much he's got, but a lot. Now he's got thousands of Bitcoin cash, too. That he got at zero price. So if he sells them for a penny, he's still making a killing. Yeah. So that's really like where I think the idea of, of the, these like people call them a scam. And I, again, I think so, there are legitimately developers who just want to like experiment with, with large block technology. Great. Go and do that. Fine. Do your research. I think that's amazing. Yeah. But asking people to buy that stuff when somebody got it at zero cost, that's a problem. In my yeah. Opinion. Yeah, yeah that, that's that's an interesting sub uh, you know subject. And again, this is a two branches that um you know one is if something that is financially incentivized and uh, you know what the, the 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 forking of bitcoin into bitcoin cash was financially incentivized um you know even though it was being tried to sell it as a, a better bitcoin right and yeah, um, i think there's a combination of factors i think there's people who legitimately were frustrated that bitcoin became expensive to use and they wanted a solution and this is what they thought the solution was and I think there's also people who capitalized on that and like hey, perhaps, their yeah. coins and made a lot of money dumping their coins, right? There's like both sides to this, right? Yeah, I agree. Uh, I agree with the with the fact that uh, some people wanted to, and maybe even Roger Veer wanted uh, Bitcoin yeah, to improve. Maybe, maybe maybe he has a legitimate, uh, um, you know, horse in that race. And I think like a lot of 
you know, a lot of these companies, look at who came to the Segway2x table. They all they were frustrated with Bitcoin being so stagnant and they wanted a solution. And this is what they thought of the solution. But the thing is, like, what you have to realize is when you propose a non-backwards compatible change, a hard fork in other words, you are always creating two coins. Otherwise, your system's not decentralized. If it's, if it's decentralized, then, then there's always going to be people who don't agree with you. Right. I, yeah. Yeah. And and then if you do create a better Bitcoin, then it is indeed better than, um, you know, the market will will speak. Yeah. You know? the market and, will speak and they'll all dump Bitcoin and will buy the new coin. But that's not what happened with Bitcoin Cash. Yeah. That's not what happened with Bitcoin Cash. And uh, another thing I want to touch is that, yes. OK. Now we have a, a Bitcoin that is you know, tangibly and resolves all these problems. And we have all these other coins that are coming around that actually don't resolve any of these problems. Um, and and actually, everything that we just discussed up to this point, when you said when you mentioned the speed, it, in order for for them to improve the speed, they have to sacrifice everything that we just talked about. So therefore, right. it just nullifies all the invention up to this point. Therefore, that 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 desire to improve the speed uh, at the sacrifice of all these problems that we we just talked about nullifies all the value in that project. Because yeah, potentially, because they will force them, they will have centralizing pressure, right? Whether it's forcing people to run bigger nodes or whether it's a more centralized dev team with a lead, clear leader as opposed to like a okay, you know, so Toshi, whatever. So now we're getting into a very interesting kind of realm because now we're getting into okay, now we have a coin uh, that you know, if you really think about it, if you really understand it, it has no value and claiming to have better value than Bitcoin because of speed. Now, uh, why would that uh, coin would uh, have a perception of value by people? And the only way to do it is to spend money to brainwash people, well, advertise, whatever you call it, that's, that's programming people. It said, if I can spend enough money to program people that it does have value, it will have value. But it depends on, there's no intrinsic value. It depends on people believing that it does have value. And sure. that brings me to the, to the, to the Bitcoin hex. <laughs> uh, do you have anything to say about that? Uh, I only know a little bit. I, I literally just heard about it like on some uh, podcast. I don't know where it was. And then I saw people tweeting about it on Twitter. And like, it's just another, I mean, it's the same thing, right? Any any situation where you take uh, and give people like free money, that money is free to them. And they're going to yeah. sell it at any above zero price. And the thing is that I think in Hex, they're also like taking Satoshi's coins and redistributing them. Or something like that. Yeah, it's yeah. Just yeah. like so irreverent too. It's like, this, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Let, let's talk about. <laughs> let's talk about this at the very end because we had a question uh, uh, from from Zezo. Uh, he's asking, um, what about a proof of stake, uh, and uh, why is it a bad idea? And um, Bitcoin Hex kind of goes on the line on, on proof of stake yeah, as opposed to proof of work. About Hex to comment on that, but I can comment on yeah. stake. So. Uh, admittedly, there are some very smart people working on, on proof of stake stuff. But let's boil it down to like I'm not a. Smart How about uh, let's let's talk about this at the very end. You yeah. know, let's answer the questions at the end uh, because well, uh, like, we, 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 this might be the end because I actually have to. Uh, one second, my wife is texting me. Uh, okay. Because uh, my kids are going to come back. Yeah, yeah. It went uh, much longer than we expected. Yeah. An hour let's take and a half. Few questions. If there's a few questions, I'm I'm cool uh, to do those, and then maybe we'll do a follow up session. Yeah. Because I know so, there's much to cover here. Yeah. So what we did cover, we covered the whole story of Bitcoin invention. You know, uh, for the sound money, and you know that this book, like um, inventing Bitcoin, that um, you still have my ah, copy right oh. here. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the I student have. has a first edition. Uh, there's only 25 copies. It's it's like provably scarce because I signed them. <laughs> yeah, but, I have a signed uh, version. It's just coming out soon, and, and um, it's going to be uh, available on Amazon, and we'll, we'll get that done uh, hopefully a couple of weeks. So, so if uh, you're you are interested to understand uh, Bitcoin, uh, please go ahead and get your copy, Inventing Bitcoin. Um, and uh, anything that we talked about this, like um, Jan is explaining it in a very elegant way, and it it might be a you know, it might be one of the best investments um, of your life. You know, this book is is free for Kindle uh, Unlimited users, um, yeah. and um, it normally costs nine ninety nine. Uh, so, strongly it's recommend short, to short. get one. This is the biggest selling point. It's like ninety pages. Okay, you can read it in a few yeah. hours. It'll probably take you like if you're new to Bitcoin, it'll probably take you a month to digest it. 
but yeah. you can read it fast and that's it's, that was one of my goals too it's easy to read look look how thin it is it's, <laughs> super thin, know, so. but very yeah. packed <laughs> yeah yeah so yeah um go to amazon get your copy of inventing bitcoin and you thank us later yeah we now do this again but yeah if there's a question I'm, we can we can talk about you do you want to talk about proof of stake so like we're gonna have to split it into the second talk we're gonna have another talk and uh, um uh, we, we can answer the zezo's question and 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 we may end because you know you have to go uh but the for the listeners we we have still a few um uh, concepts to talk about and that is like pol political influence um and then what is next problems that are being resolved and what are potential bitcoin improvement you know proposals that we envision uh, you know in to uh, to happen in in the user experience is one of them and Jan is 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 uh, yeah I mean, um, interested in that we can until they they get here probably uh, yeah five minutes or something like that and then we're going to talk about the, the this mind blowing concept of how intelligent protocol um, you know relates relates to, to to human behavior, and then we're going to go into AI. So we're going to leave this for the next talk. Um, so right now let's let's finish it with Zezo question, which is um, you know why uh, Bitcoin uh, sorry why uh, why proof of stake is um, bad idea in crypto. Okay, so proof of stake the, the fundamental idea is like you put up some kind of resource. Uh, let's say money typically or, or the token of the system uh, and then if you you know do the correct thing you you win some tokens and if you don't then you lose them right uh, it's important to understand that proof of work is also a type of staking right you are staking energy though so in proof of work you're staking kind of two things you're staking energy like uh, physical dollars spent on electricity and also you're staking hardware that you've purchased okay those are the things that you're staking in proof of stake systems, you're typically just taking the token of that system. So, in terms of corrupting the system, uh, if I have like a, a trillion dollars, it's way easier for me to buy up a bunch of stake on Ethereum than it is for me to buy up a trillion dollars worth of ASICs and energy. Okay, so that right there is a big difference between those two systems. Proof of work is proof of stake, except for you're staking things that are really hard to get like hardware and electricity, okay? So you're not gonna get anything better than hardware and electricity. Um, now you're gonna have a bunch of people that are saying Bitcoin is eating the world's electricity, but there's great articles, I'm not gonna go into that now, but no, it's not. It's actually driving um, us to have cheaper energy and it's going to end up being a huge energy innovation driver, in my opinion. Uh, and we're gonna see all the stranded energy. We see companies like Upstream Data take stranded gas and uh, and turn it into Bitcoin. like. This is a good thing. Proof of work is a very good thing. And uh, frankly, if Bitcoin establishes as a world currency, uh, we will stop mining gold at the rates we're mining. That's a bunch of waste. I mean, Christmas lights for a week in America waste more energy than Bitcoin. Like, this stuff is just absurd. So, so mm -hmm. proof of work is a much more secure system for that reason. You need the hardware, you need the electricity. Very hard to do on a massive scale. Proof of stake, if you have enough money, you can do anything. Mm. So, um, so what Jan is said is, is basically, you know to summarize is that um the electrical uh, electricity use intrinsically is not necessarily harmful to the planet it's where that electricity is coming from because we do have infinite power from uh um, yeah, some, some solar uh, geothermal you know, geothermal there's there's plenty of energy so so when people people and vilify bitcoin for using a lot of electricity which means you know bitcoin has to use a lot of energy it has to consume time and energy right because those are the precious precious resources everybody values if you if you do remove that you remove any kind of value right so we you, we cannot do that that the only thing we can do is to make sure that electricity comes from you know renewable sources and that's the focus is supposed to be not that bitcoin is bad for the planet and not that bitcoin needs to or some sort of new coin that needs to uh, that acts like bitcoin but without the burning of electricity or anything like that. you cannot have that it's impossible right so so that's the answer to that question is that we have to make sure that electricity is renewable and uh, you know plentiful and not some sort of like a clean coal you know yeah and you know i'm a, i'm an environmentalist guy like I, i'm not like a hardcore uh, i'm i'm more left wing than i am right wing i'm i'm very libertarian but mm -hmm. as far as like social like i want the environment to be good i don't want oil companies in my backyard fuck that um, but i love bitcoin because i actually think it's going to do those things I think it's going to create capitalist incentives to do those things, which is way better than the, the state trying to incentivize it. 
Yeah. So, so th that's kind of a primary difference between proof of stake and uh, proof of work is, is that there is that sacrifice of time and energy, which like we all share as value. I mean, there is no human on this planet who doesn't value time and energy. You know, you take time from any person and, you know, that might be like the biggest punishment uh, that, uh, that you can give because you shorten somebody's life. So everybody's valuing that. We can't, we can't, uh, we can't uh, eliminate that. Therefore, the proof of work is, is um, would you say, a far superior in this case uh, as proof of stake? I, I think so. Like I said, it is, it is proof of stake. It's just taking something that's hard to obtain, whereas mm -hmm. proof of stake typically means taking something that's relatively easy to obtain, which is tokens, like mm -hmm. gold, metallic, at gunpoint, and you can stake as much Ethereum as you want. Well, then <laughs> you just, you, you, just <laughs> you just collapsed the whole proof of stake with this argument. Yeah. I just I, I feel like it's a pretty trivial argument to make. Like proof of stake goes back to identify the richest people in the ecosystem, go rob them, have control of the system, enjoy. Right? Like it goes yeah. back to the very thing that we talked about. Like you can't have a system where you can identify the stakers. If you can identify who's running the show, then you have coercion. Okay. And I'm not even talking about go rob them. I'm talking about the government can come after them. I'm talking about like you know, things like that could happen, right? Things that are just natural consequences of knowing who the stakers are. With mining, it's much more difficult. Government shuts down one mining operation, another one starts up in the hills somewhere in an undisclosed location. It's like All right. solar, whatever. All right, so that's that's the answer to your question, Zezo. Uh, proof of stake, no. Proof of work, yes. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, All right. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jan, for uh, coming on to my show. This is my first show. And, you know, this is very pleasure. special. Great. Great uh, there, we had a lot of people um, really complimenting this show. Everybody is um, excited, you know, hearing us talk, it seems. So we're definitely going to do this again. Uh, um, really appreciate for coming on to sure, my show. And more and time. This is a long, uh, a long show. Hopefully people stuck with it. But uh, yeah. We can do more, you know, smaller segments or something, then and, and focus on on some topics. Yes, I think uh, like um, well, we, we we took like hour and a half to try to explain Bitcoin. I think we can do better. It would be interesting experiment if we can explain Bitcoin like in in, in what is the smallest time we can explain. I know Bitcoin that's like I, that's my life uh, challenge right now. It's like nice, 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 nice. Every time should I make it shorter? But all right, well, right now we have hour and a half. You know, yeah. hour and a half. Let's try to shrink it down. To For sure. For sure. All, All right. right. Thank you very much. All right. Much. Thanks, Jan. All right. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Right, Thank uh, you. Take care. Bye. Bye.